Hi guys, I'm Achir. Welcome back. This is our second salon with you. So we are officially good at this. Uh, you came back. That's a good sign. Uh, again, you will be talking to uh, my friend Visa Kanvarasamy, who's joining us from Singapore, and myself, Anagat, founder and CEO of Interinteract. I'm joining you from Brussels, where for some reason the sun didn't bother coming up today, so I don't really know what time it is. Um, and we will be continuing our last conversation um, where we discussed what it means to be home on the internet. What are the uh, no longer existing dichotomies between online and offline? How should one go about finding one's tribe and how that might be different from the kind of tribalism we discuss when we talk about the negative aspects of the internet like polarization. Um, today we will be talking about something that, I love salons that come out of multiple different conversations. It's a little bit like a synthesis, right? So Emma, you and I, we were talking about the future when we were in San Francisco um, recently, or when I was there recently, um, and you know, we saw you have been talking about the, the questions of around golden age for a while, and you even hosted a salon on this. Why this is interesting uh, to me, um, well, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but mainly because we want to know how to evaluate the present so that we can really well plan for the future. Um, there are competing narratives uh, around this, and this has been so probably since the earliest person crawled out of a cave and looked at the moon and decided that tomorrow will be a good time to go hunting because it will be very bright uh, during the night. Um, whether this is a good time or it will be better in the future or it was, it was better in the past. Uh, Visa, you recently posted this wonderful thread on Twitter, uh, which I really took to heart. Um, where you discuss how, you know, the present is always so noisy. We don't all, we usually know when it's really bad. Like probably people during the first world war in the trenches knew that this is not normal. <laughs> like what's happening here is not good. Uh, but when it's good, we sometimes don't know. And then it comes, you know, our world in data and Steven Pinker and people telling you that this is great today. And then some contingent of people will get super offended. Like, how dare you say it's good to be alive today when so many people are still suffering? Um, and then you're trying to look at the graph and point that it's going upwards, but that people are offended by that as well sometimes. Um, but we also don't know. And, and there are, you know, questions of individual type and characteristics at play here as well. There are people who seem to be more, this is close to what Emma, you and I discussed um, in Asaf. There are people who are nostalgic about their own past or the pasts of you know, their nations or religions, cultures, um, and who feel that something was lost. And there are people like myself, I think it's a typical immigrant attitude who are like, no, the past, you don't want to go back there. Every, all the good stuff is ahead. We, have, we were just getting started. You know, in, every time I talk about interns, I'm like, guys, we haven't done like 0.5% of all we will be doing, right? Um, and it is, raises an interesting question, like what it means to be a progressive in 2021. Can you be a kind of non-political or extra-political, extra-partisan progressive who just very correctly thinks in the great Monty Hall problem of life, that statistically it's quite probable that the good stuff is somewhere out there, right? Uh, just because- I love that you're not biased, Anna. You don't, have a, you don't have a point of view on this. It's really a, you know, <laughs> Sorry? Uh, uh, you're, really a, you're really an open moderator who just sees both sides as having equal, an equally strong point. <laughs> I think there are arguments on both sides, right? And I would love to, uh, would love to dive into that. <laughs> no, uh, what, I, I think we all agree fundamentally that like the, the uh, we're not particularly nostalgic to go back to the past. Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's funny. I, did, I, thought, I thought you said it was funny. The, uh, uh, you, the particularly, uh, what your phrasing was like, the obviously true point of view, the, the, the good stuff's in the future. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean, I kind of feel that way, but. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I typify myself as an immigrant, there it kind of comes with the territory, right? But then you can also say, well, there are there there is an immigrant version of nostalgia and homesickness and trying to kind of bring the old country with you, and that also leads to interesting kind of cultural synthesis. I, I would say that there are some things that are fundamentally acts of optimism, and you know, hosting salons and organizing, bringing people together is in some ways intrinsically optimistic. Even if you want to discuss pessimistic stuff, you know, it's because you believe that you can share those ideas with other people and that they will receive it and that they will respond to it. Those are all optimistic things. Like I, I would argue that like 
the true pessimist is like nihilistic and just like I, nothing I do or say matters, so I'm not going to bother, right? So if you have intentionality, that's like intrinsic. Yeah. So that's my opt- optimistic view of like all actions almost. You know, you, to attempt anything is fundamentally an act of optimism because there's, there's some sense in which you think it might matter that you're doing it. Uh, it's like you can't, you can't build something or connect people without, it, without implicitly making the statement and this is worth doing. And so I think like, you know, the, the, yeah, the people I know who I, I think of as the most cynical uh, uh, are, are always finding reasons not to do instead of reasons to do. And I think that is pessimism. Like there's always a good reason not to do that thing, not to try the thing. Um, but the reason I think we're living in a golden age is that we have this employee who is, he was, he was brilliant but also probably one of the most cynical, pessimistic people I've ever worked with. And it was very hard working with him sometimes because he saw how everything was not going to work. And the reason why I think we're in a golden age is that he got caught up in the whirlpool of, of San Francisco and wound up starting a startup anyway, which has got to be the, like, that's got to be the single most like idealistic, optimistic thing I've ever seen someone do. And uh, I don't think it wound up doing that well, but the fact that even he wound up starting a startup because because the, the gestalt of being in San Francisco is so strongly, you should go build something and do something. Like the, the future is here to be built. You have to go try. And he, even he did it. That's like, like clearly we must be, there's, there are other times where like the people who are against it wouldn't start things. I find, I mean, I, I'm personally at a, you know, a stage where I find a lot of the arguments around optimism and pessimism very complicated. Because it's always also a type of optimism where you say, I, I'm not going to do this because there will be a better moment to do this, right? That there's mm-hmm. the kind of the pro- procrastinators kind of indefinite uh, optimism. There's, all, I, I, I find myself kind of in the middle. Uh, a lot of my optimism comes from the otherwise quite pessimistic take that all the other alternatives would be worse. Let's do this one thing. Um, and mm-hmm. I, but I don't find that, you know, um, little Disney butterfly type idealistic optimism. It's more of a, of a, of a pragmatic one that, uh, you know, things will get better if I work hard for it, uh, which is kind of, a, <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know if that's pure optimism. Well, I, I, uh, I was reading this article, I can't remember who said, I wish I could cite the source for this somewhere. I'm sure I could find it if I searched long enough. Maybe someone um, with you will find it's, it. Uh, but it's, uh, it's about how like, uh, there's this model of, of uh, human behavior that comes out of psychology where everything's about uh, managing your anxiety and your depression and like the, the fear and that's like this big thing and uh, and how uh, everyone is like uh, Buddhism kind of links to this also where like life is suffering all the time and I always read those things and I was like I mean I, I get what they I think I get what they mean but like you know with dukkha and like the idea that life is suffering but I'm like my experience of life is not generally suffering actually my personal experience of life is generally pretty good like if I do nothing if I just if there isn't some external force acting upon me I'm, I feel pretty good most of the time. Like for the most part, my find my life is, is mostly contentment and fulfillment and joy, which is totally unfair. And, uh, and I think it's kind of one of those things like aphantasia where the people who are writing about it just assumed everyone's experience of the world was like theirs. But actually there's a whole bunch of diversities of experience of the world. Some people can imagine things in full color 3D. And some people, when they imagine things, it's more of the gestalt of the thing. And there's no strong visual that comes with it at all and everywhere in between. And I kind of think that mood is like that. And actually, I think most of optimism is, is mood. It's like when you think about the future, do you, do you, does it feel scary and overwhelming or does it feel exciting and positive? And that has very little to do with like, at least in my experience, the actual state of the world. My experience of feeling optimistic is that things can be very bad and there can be no real hope of success. And I can still feel very optimistic if I'm in a good mood and vice versa, things can be going really well. I can feel horrible if I'm not in a good mood. And so I think we, we, there's optimism like your formalized best guess estimates of the future. And there's optimism like your emotional state. And I think those are only loosely connected at best. Like, cause I've, I've experienced in the two by two of those all of the quadrants. And I reg- I'm fairly regular too, they're not rare. If, they're if, like, they're, if, I don't, it's not even clear to me that it's correlated. Let, even, let, not, not only that they're not the same, but like, I'm just trying to think, I'd have to go back and score it. I have to go back and like, you know, 
I sit in the future and like emotional mood and like check, are they even correlated? Because I'm it's not obvious they are to me. If we collectively improved on the mood of humans, we would be more optimistic, you think? I'm thinking of Aldous Huxley, right? Like give the drugs to the people, everybody's super happy and they are mm -hmm. just happily marching into death. Right. Yeah, maybe the lithium in the water supply, in addition to making us fat, is also making us all happier. I mean, so there's, there's some nuance there about, like, so the, I think the Huxleyan model of, of happiness is a very, it's very pleasure focused, right? The idea that people are going to distract themselves with pleasure, but there's also like flow and purpose and meaning, which is like different, different parts of, of pleasure, of, of happiness, right? Or joy or, or your positive mood. And it's, it's almost like a balanced diet. Like, it's like, if you only have pleasure, it's like you only have sugar, but you have no fat and protein. I don't know if I'm being too technical, but there's, there's something there, I think, about uh, a lack of, of diversity, a lack of, of kind of a range of nuance in the moods that people experience. I, I don't, uh, I find I get almost nauseous after overconsumption of pleasure. Like I love playing computer games, but after I've played for three or four hours, I start to experience this like, uh, it's like you've eaten, it, it's actually very similar to the feeling of like you've eaten too much chocolate cake and it was delicious and I liked it. And that third slice, my body's just like, no, no, it's not good anymore. Like you, you, you but it is, it still tastes good, but like, uh, I don't know. And, and I find that's true with most like other kinds of pleasures too. Like overconsumption leads to, like that isn't actually nice. Um, uh, and it really, I like the balanced diet metaphor. I think that, I think, yeah. you know, it, it, it gets pretty, it's a common metaphor in some ways, but I think it's very, it's good, solid. And then it, what's interesting from there, I think is to go from an individual's personal experience to sensing, you know, the mood of a, you could say the mood of a nation or the mood of a city mm -hmm. or the mood of, of a time, right? Even a, a decade seems to have a certain overall mood of, mm -hmm. of it feels like, late 90s there was a certain optimism and then like you know 9-11 and time after that a certain mood and then when you consider people's feelings and and projections and models in relation to the the mood of the times like that's something that seems like it can be analyzed it can almost be as well different so different, different people may have different ideas about the degrees to which you can kind of see where the waves are going and can you surf the waves accordingly and can you control the waves to some degree right like these are all like things that i guess i, I would say are the, it's kind of the topic that we want to discuss today like to what what what, what is the wave that we're surfing on you know how how mm -hmm. chaotic is it how much can we steer it and i mean so, so I, I just want to kind of share my own um like thesis or my, I don't know if thesis is the right word my, just is where I'm at with this stuff right so I have been kind of obsessed with with understanding historical scenes and golden ages for a few years now like uh, there's this there's this essay from 1997 by David Banks who's a statistician and he's like saying you know if you look at human history and progress progress happens you might if you if you haven't read history you might think oh you know progress must be kind of slow and steady throughout human history and like the stone age and then there's the iron age and blah 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 and it just feels like it must be kind of incremental and steady but when you actually look at it you zoom in, it's like it's incredibly spiky it's like in certain short periods of time in history like they invent zero you know they invent like they invent a tremendous amount of things in a short amount of time and it's super spiky and like, if you have any kind of intellectual honesty and you care about progress and you care about well-being, like you have to be like, how did those things happen? How and and how you know how does it work? And can we make it happen again? And like, what 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 what's going on there? And so since then, I've been like okay, trying to reverse engineer and stuff. And there there is a lot of scholarship about this stuff, but people don't discuss it in common day-to-day -day life so much. So that's part of what I hope we can do. And whenever then the other thing is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Whenever you see smooth progress like that but you zoom in, mm -hmm. you see smooth progress at the macro level, but you zoom in and things look messy and jerky. What, you, what you're almost always seeing, what must be true is there's a feedback system at work. Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's, a, there's a positive feedback system and a negative system, feedback system at work, like in tension with each other. And if you get off of, if you get above the, the progress line, above the rate of growth that you're supposed to be at, the negative feedback system kicks in and pushes you back down. And if you fall below, the positive feedback system kicks in and there's some balancing system that, that is driving you to a status quo because otherwise that never it's impossible to sustain anything stable like a stable growth rate over many many years without some kind of external 
feedback balancing system. And I think the interesting thing is it's really clear what the positive feedback system is in progress, right? At some level. Like, at least that gets talked about a lot. I think it's pretty clear what it is. Like, you invent new things, they give you new insights. That leads to new te technologies and new ways of interacting that open up the door to new ones that are built on top of that. But what's the negative feedback system? What's the balancing side of that? That progress doesn't just keep accelerating, where you know, you've made a little too much progress here and we need, like, it's going to get tamped back down again, back into line. And that's not so obvious. I'm actually not sure what that is, but there's something, there's something there stopping us uh, that's pushing us back into the, you know, yeah. into the, the main line. So EA Fisher actually just posted in the chat. You want to you share your, your perspective? Like, just this idea of, uh... And I think it's true. Like in my own research, when I look at scenes, right, it's like there's this early stage of, of high optimism, high trust. People are doing the work and there's a lot of growth. And then there, it kind of overextends eventually. And then there's like bureaucracy and like uh, there's people mimicking, trying to trying to get status and trying to get, uh, you know, just it just gets bloated. It, it, it rhymes with things like even like, uh, you know, why is it that a TV show with the first two seasons was amazing and then they extend it for like seven seasons and the last three seasons are horrible? Like there's a parallel there where you have a great seat like in Florence or in Shakespearean London or whatever. Like there's something amazing that happens and then everyone just rushes in and it's like a hug of death. And that's like similar to the Tower of Babel comment. Yeah, exceedingly rosy expectations. People cooperate less, more self-centered. Yeah, it really does seem to be, to be there. <laughs> yeah, and so I, that, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Oh yeah, the thing is that I, I've been thinking about this like uh, like a long time. Um, and I think it all boils down to the Tower of Babel, right? I don't know if you guys know the story. It's about like some dudes and gals that basically wanted to build this tower to like the heavens. And they started like doing well. Like they were really happy. Like, dude, we're gonna get to the heavens and we're gonna have like the stairway to heaven. Like no Led Zeppelin camp. Like, no, this is gonna be the thing, right? But apparently, like eventually, like people, like they just the whole project went south, right? And the thing is that you, if you see it in the Bible, like the Bible says, like okay, the devil made me do it, right? And but the thing is that if you take, as you said, Emmett, like in the beginning, if you take a cooperation, a creation through cooperation, and doing this thing as a golden age, in order to straw man the argument, right? You, we are living in a golden age because everyone is cooperating through, like, like creating things through cooperation. Right, but that leads to exceedingly rosy expectations about things. And then when people like put the do the back burner that cooperation through creation and start like consuming those rosy expectations for them for themselves in order to be them to, to become some self-centered about it, then like like entropy is a bitch. Like things will eventually go like eventually will go down south. And you could actually you could argue that this is a balancing system. So how do you, my question would be, how do you, are a, like, because we have two choices, right? We have the choice of being average and like continue average in order, and continue average in order not to like, like defy entropy or basically just become volatile um, as a derivative in order for you to get the gains of volatility over time. But that thing, that thing will get you the wild swings either way. So what do you do? I just want to, one, one point of order on the Tower of Babel story. I think it's important. Uh, the devil is not responsible for the fall of the Tower of Babel or the fall of man. God is. God shows up and he's like, no, you have reached beyond what man is meant to do. And God strikes them down and God scatters them. And God confuses their language so they cannot hear each other. So it's not actually, it's not the devil stopping us. Uh, it's, uh, it's the source of all, you know, the, the, the all good, all knowing, all wise God comes down and is like, no. And, and, and so I, I think it's interesting. I think it, because the modern version of the story, if Marvel was writing it, it would definitely be the bad guy that does it, right? But, uh, but, the, but there's something, I think there's something really important and nuanced there about, that, about the story. But I, I, I just wanted to add that because sort of, for me, that's a really important part of the, uh, the way the, the story is written. Um, I think we can kind of synthesize it. So in yeah, in the Old Testament logic, it's like the devil tempting man to try and like defy God or you know. So even even just like if you go to the Adam and Eve uh, Garden of Eden thing, like the snake tempted man to take knowledge. So it's, that's like this Old Testament logic of uh, really you know don't dare rise above your station, don't dare do things that you're not supposed to do, blah blah. blah. 
But that feels a bit like a, it's, it's like a sh- almost a schism between that Old Testament vengeful, almost closed game logic versus like the New Testament open love like forgiveness kind of kind of logic. I feel like this. I mean, I, I'm not a scholar on, on uh, <laughs> biblical yeah. texts, but that, that's the vibe that I get. It's like they were written in different eras, right? So um, much of the Old Testament is still uh, the vengeful tribal cool. god. Whereas uh, in the New Testament, you have uh, the, the Greek humanism kind of mixing into the uh, Jewish worldview um, and you end up with something that's a little bit softer. <laughs> uh, but it's not- very right? And, and it is a much more, um, you know, we could argue that the New Testament is far more optimistic, right? To say that heaven is on earth and that uh, you don't have to belong to a certain nation, a certain tribe um, to qualify for a redemption. Uh, that was kind of groundbreaking and, and, and in many ways, you know, um, there are similarities, you know, not just because St. Paul was probably the best email marketer <laughs> in the history of email marketing, uh, literally built a church just like sending out letters, um, but also because, you know, it, Christianity in many ways is the first truly globalized um, religion, right, that used uh, ancient Rome's um, internal infrastructure, both on roads and 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 and, and sea, um, and the very intricate um, international system of slaves, right? So Christianity studied that as a slave religion. It was counterculture. Uh, it was uh, first uh, the the, the yeah. slaves in Rome who uh, were liberated by the notion that um, you know they matter. Um, and then, you know, you can imagine that the patrician's rebellious daughter first wore the blue jeans and was like, dad, I'm a Christian now. OK, you're not telling me what to do. Um, and then a couple of decades later, dad was like, yeah, I, I'm a Christian, too. And then and, and you can kind of reverse engineer the whole thing. Um, so that it is a very optimistic uh, religion. Maybe that's um, maybe we could argue that all world religions, all the five, you know, ones that um survive the great Darwinism of religions um, must be optimistic. Otherwise we would have filtered them out or they would have ended up as a suicide cult somewhere, Um, which, you know, again, takes us back to the utility of optimism and my eternal moral, you know, dilemma over it is, is, is are we progressives just because it pays out? (laughs) Or uh, or is there, is there actually a way to, uh, to think about in a more uh, nuanced way? I mean, the- Daniel just left an interesting comment in the chat about uh, his side project and, and mm-hmm. the evolution of the Western American gay community. Daniel, you want to share a few thoughts about what do you think? About how, how mm-hmm. I guess, how institutions have evolved? Sure. So <clears throat> this project just started because I think of myself as a pretty optimistic person. I mean, I'm in the salon, so I, I do think we're in a golden age, but... Um, on the ground, I witnessed a lot of gay men, both in the dating world and just socially. They viewed the world uh, for gay men specifically as a very harsh place where prejudice is increasing. And I thought either I'm insane or they're wrong um, because prejudice is clearly declining. Social victories are one after the other. Um, And they, I mean, social acceptance has also climbed to record highs. So uh, my side project, is just it's just a long running research project that wonders why is there such a divergence between how gay men view the landscape and how the landscape actually is. And there's a lot of stuff that's been written about this. There are therapists who have written about it, um, except none of them have written about it in the context of say like a golden age. Um, so, I mean, I, I've conducted interviews um, with a lot of men about this and talked to some people who have written like therapists who have written books about this. And it's really just, um, for me, the, the linchpin is just how institutions treat the social progress. So, I mean, we see it outside of social progress, but if an institution is built to fight an adversary and they never develop, they never develop an identity outside of that, what happens when the adversary is defeated? You, you either change your identity or you conjure adversaries where there aren't really any. And in general, there are exceptions. But in general, I think that many gay institutions that have been fighting for progress have chosen to conjure enemies instead of pivot. And now, of course, there are always still things to do. um, But the fact that they have leaned so hard into the 
conjure adversaries narrative that feeds into a, a larger social phenomenon of pessimism where it's not warranted at all. I, mean, I, see, I, I see the exact same thing. I was at a party I was talking to a woman and she was telling me how, you know, basically everything is going really badly. And it was interesting because of the very specific topic she picked, I can't remember what it was, I think it was, uh, oh, it was income. Like people, people in America are worse off than before. I was like, I, I just don't think that's true. Like if you go, what was the year where they were better off? Let's go back and like, look, what, you know, what was the median income? How big were the houses they had? What was the, you know, did they have TVs? Did they have refrigerators? Did they, you know, what, let's, let's look. And of course it turns out when you go back to whatever year you want to pick, in fact, people are better off now. Like in any objective, by any objective measure you want care to pick, they're better off, which is the parallel to the exact thing you're saying with the gay community and, and prejudice. And, and yet, you know, everything is awesome and no one is happy. And, and uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, when your perceptions don't match reality, right? What, what's feeding those perceptions? Um, yeah. You know. this, this reminds me of two things. One is, uh, so a lot of people, it's known that a lot of people thought that the Vietnam War was more like horrific in human costs than World War II which is like, you know, from the numbers, it's not true. But the difference was that the Vietnam War was televised, right? Like you saw it, people saw it at dinner and they saw the horrific footage and the bombs and people, all, all the images. And that had an impact on people's psyche. And so that's an interesting thing to think about because there was more horror going on in World War II, but people were almost blissfully unaware of it. They, like everyday folks in, their, in the family, like the, the, the news that gets filtered to them is less. And I kind of parallel this with my person. So this is a very personal kind of small thing compared to war, right? But like uh, with regards to growing up as, as a brown person in Singapore, for example, right? Um, which is like Chinese majority, Indian and Malay minority. I would say that uh, things have gotten better every year. Like, it was never that bad in the grand scheme of things. It was, you know, it's, uh, that, there's a long story, it all separates a lot. But, you know, I would say that I would rather be my nephew than me in terms of like what, I go through versus what he goes through. Like there's, there's this more conversation. People are more understanding, sympathetic. People, like people understand that racism is a thing. But I also see my younger friends who are like, so I'm 31. I've seen my friends who are like 20, 21. And while they have networks of support with each other, which me and my wife didn't have when we were growing up, right? So they have, they have all this support networks and stuff, which is amazing. They are also like, whenever any one bad thing happens, it totally dominates the, the news cycle for them like for like three days right and they just non-stop just focused on that and it you can really see it really takes a toll on their psyche like they're rattled by it in a way that like those of us who are older we're like oh yeah that happens you know it's happened all our lives we're used to it but like we because for them it's like a formative experience they're still like 20 and they're still making they're still developing like their model of reality and if they spend three days every couple of months kind of fixated in this in this conflict it really kind of imprints on them. And so it's this very strange thing where, yeah, things are better, but people feel worse because they're really in the muck of it. And it feels like we will, so my, my big picture kind of perspective and a, a slightly prescriptive is that it feels like we almost have not yet developed etiquette and like social norms for how to manage this sort of information. And apparently when telephones first came out, People would just call each other randomly <laughs> throughout the day and like, like they wouldn't even say, hello, my name is. So it would just be weird and confusing. And, and until people started writing into magazines and there'll be like magazine articles on, oh, the etiquettes of the do's and don'ts of how to use your telephone, right? Make sure that you say I'm calling so-and-so. And it feels like we have not, we are in the process of figuring that out, I think. Like when some- Yeah, totally. Like, Don't call someone without texting first. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> no, but it's serious. Like the norms have changed in cell phones. Like, like- I would almost would never call a friend without texting them first to see if now is a good time to chat. Like it just, it seems impolite most of the, I mean, there's situations where it's okay, but a lot of the time it's like, really text first. Like it, it's, you know. And, and if you find, if you find a missed call, an unannounced missed call from mm -hmm. somebody you know, you assume the worst. Like if I come out of yeah, the shower yeah. and there's yeah. one call and no text, I'm like, this person died. Like <laughs> no other, there's no, literally no other options here. But I want to go back to, uh, to, to some of these notes because it's so, so interesting. You know, when people ask me like, where would I time travel? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm a woman. I wouldn't time travel anywhere. Like maybe like nine, Back to like 1992 Stockholm would probably be the earliest that I'm willing to go back. Like there's no time in the history of humanity when I would have had it better. And, and I think this is why, you know, studying history matters. You have to know that your life is incredibly well-timed. 
I think about that a lot for myself. Like if we look at our 1 million uh, year long history, my birth was at least as it looks now, it was really well timed. I kind of vote and the Nazis didn't want to murder me. I could leave the East Bloc, you know, like it's just a matter of a couple of decades, right? And, and if you look at your life from that perspective, suddenly you see all the things that you can do. And um, so whenever you find yourself in that party conversation with somebody, you know, these are, you know, worth bringing up. And there might be other, um, you know, comebacks and you can say like, oh yeah, but when I tried to enter the job market, uh, the recession happened. And then you're like, yeah, but you can vote, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, then you can kind of put that into perspective. <laughs> the, uh, uh, if you look at like what makes something feel like a golden age as opposed to, because things generally have gotten better over time. Not a hundred percent, because things have certainly go back, you know, you, I think if you were living in Rome and then you were, you know, there are a couple of periods where 200 years later, you really, it really was better before uh, to, work, to live where you were living. But generally over this roof history, things have gotten better. And most people could say most of the time that, it, you, but like what makes it a golden age, I think, is that uh, you accumulated a sufficient number of points. No, wait, that's civil. Um, uh, what makes it a golden age is that uh, you, you have, uh, you have an unlocking of an opportunity to claim a bunch of territory or like that. It's one of those periods where it goes like this before whatever the countervailing force is kicks in and like squashes it and brings you back into line with the historical growth trend. And uh, so I'm reading this book called The Fifth Discipline, which is why this balancing thing is in my, my mind right now. Fifth Discipline's a great book. Uh, I think anyway, so I'm about halfway through it. I can't uh, promise you anything at the end. Uh, but their their point is that the if you want to, if you want to make a golden, you know, create a golden age. If you want to make things go faster, actually, usually the positive feedback part, the obvious part of the cycle that's like doing the thing is not where you need to look because doing more of that thing, uh, all it does is cause the, uh, the other balancing side of the cycle to kick in harder. And the harder you push to create advancement, once you've, once the other loop has kicked in, the more it will push back. And, and you, the actual way thing to do is to focus on the things that are stopping it and try to pull those out, try to attenuate the, the stopping loop and the, the, your loop will go on just fine on its own. And I thought that's a, when you think about it in terms of like societal and golden ages, what is it that's, what, one thing it stopped it, like I, I, I think actually literally caused, it caused a slowdown is that we filled up San Francisco and the Bay Area and we ran out of places to move people. And if we'd had twice as much housing here, there would have been like the world productivity would have gone up to two points of GDP because, because it was the most productive place to put people. But instead this countervailing force of like, oh, we ran out of, and people are protecting things the way they are. And that looks like to me, like the kind of countervailing force that like is like, nope, put the brakes on. We're it's good enough here. We're not gonna, no more. Um, and so I wonder, you know, what, what are the other things like that that are out there where where there's this opportunity for things to keep going, but someone's hitting the, you know, pumping the brakes. Wow, yeah, that's that's true. I mean, I do, I do see, I do see um, um, some overlap here with what Daniel was uh, was mentioning um, around gay culture. I think you know, gay rights is a really interesting area of somewhat, you know, a, a kind of conservatism that uh, could have been let go of a long time ago, right? Um, you know, the, the Family Guy episode about what the world without Christianity, well, we don't know where we would be, but um, you know, if we could have continued the Greek um, and Roman tradition of just normalizing gay relationships in society, uh, would have, so like, I think those are quite good examples of um, personal versions of the NIMBY, right? Because the whole NIMBY movement of not building new things um, into places is, is a kind of nostalgia, right? Let's keep it as it is now. Well, the, the thing that makes me think of is uh, the, the old saying that science advances one funeral at a time, right? Um, because the countervailing force in science is really clear. It's the preeminent experts in the field prevent progress. And like pretty consistently, and you, you just have to wait for the people who have this old model. And it, you don't actually have to wait them for all to die. Sometimes they do update their model, but it's just slow and takes a while. Um, and I wonder to the degree to which that's true for uh, not just 
you know, science, but like take the gay rights example um, that Daniel was talking about, like making further progress requires you in some sense to stop fighting the last war, yeah. right? Like if you, you won the last war, great. To do the next thing, to get, to, to fix the next problems requires you to do something different, to let go of that. But the way, well, the way we generally make that progress is you, uh, you wait for the people who fought the worst, the first war, who made their names with creating all this progress to like retire. And then, there, then there's space to do new things. And uh, uh, you, you wait for the, 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 in the gay rights example, the institutions to lose their credibility, to de for institutional decay to set in, for them to become weak. And then, and then some new thing get, captures the energy of, of a new generation. They go push in a new direction. And if you wanted to accelerate that process, uh, uh, counterintuitively, I mean, this is this is, you know, it would be you know, force early retirement in your in your area, right? Like, like, sorry, you can only work in the field of of bioengineering for twenty five years, and after twenty five years, you out. Sorry, we got to have new people in. Like, you, you can go work in chemistry. Go work on some new field where you're where you're now a newcomer again, and we'll even give you extra bonus points in the beginning because you did such a good job in the last field. Um, I'm wondering what that means for uh, for our personal lives, right? I mean, I think you and I discussed this. Uh, weird thing that we're dealing with where, you know, life expectancy is increasing in most parts of the West. And it means that, you know, for our generation, our parents will, you know, hopefully live until we are old. Like we will all be mm -hmm. Prince Charles. We will turn 80 um, and we will still be the children of somebody. Um, and I think that's a pretty new situation for uh, for humanity, right? Like we, we first we dealt with the uh, wonderful, you know, phenomenon of babies staying alive, uh, which completely changed our culture and our, I think our general mood. Um, and now we will be dealing with the with the other side of it, which is that people won't retire early in the in the personal and, and the physical sense. Well, the the issue is that starting your career over is hard, and people don't like doing it. And if you allow them to, for the most part, once people have a you know, you've been spent twenty years in a field, the chances that you want to switch fields is like pretty low because switching fields is expensive and you kind of gotten used to not having to work that hard anymore because you you have all this experience and uh uh i think it'd be amazing to have a no norms around this and and this sort of idea you go hey you go back to school you kind of you 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 get a period of four years where you're not working where you go you go you leave the thing you're doing after you, you put in your 20 years and then you, that's the beginning of a new thing but and I guess I, my dad, I remember growing up, my dad gave me this advice over and over again, which was that uh, uh, you, know, you should conceptualize your life as a series of 10 to 15 year projects. And I thought that was a really, like, I don't know. I didn't even, I didn't, I just thought that was how reality was because that's what he told me over and over again. Um, but that it really does to a degree, I think you do that uh, prevent you from getting stuck. But like, I think it's also good for the world because I don't know, the beginner's mind's a real thing. I think a lot of the most productive, prolific people, they, uh, they, they contribute across a large variety of fields. And I don't think that's because it's like an accident. I think it's because uh, there's this energy you get from looking at something the first time or the second time that when you've been doing something for 20 years, it's hard to see the new stuff anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to kind of cycle around a little bit. And so when I posted the, the Golden Age uh, tweet that I did that's in the thread, uh, one of my friends replied with, uh, with a meme, which is like a Skyla and Chapadis, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, meme, Scylla. And it's like, one is we are already in the Golden Age of the 2000s. And the other one is like, we're already in the Dark Age of the 2000s. And then like, we are kind of steering the boat in between, trying to, trying to navigate between both. And, you know, I, I wonder if we should, we should take a moment to kind of, like consider the the alternate inter interpretation like there are definitely people who are convinced that we are living in you know like on the on the brink of collapse right and supply chain stuff is screwing up and uh you know politics seems deadlocked and I don't know, Emma, do you have any thoughts about that? Anna, do you have any thoughts about that? I guess to... Yeah, I do, but I would also be, in three minutes, we are at 50 minutes. So I will invite the audience to please put your hand up and um, uh, raise the roof and jump in uh, when you're called, uh, if you have anything to add. Emma? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, uh, 
there's just such this long history for the past hundred years. And I guess that, you know, it's possible that this time is different. It's always possible this time is different, but we're the population bomb, the, and the, this, the long bet of like, oh, everything is going terribly. And there's this, you know, stuff, it's, everything's gonna it'd be horrible. And then, and the people who take that side of the bet just keep losing over and over <laughs> and over again, like consistently, two decades later, you look back you're like, oops, nope, that wasn't right. And so it's just, it, it's increasingly hard. For, it's just very hard for me to credit that point of view, even though at an object level, it's something when I think about trying to fix any of the actual problems, it feels so hopeless. Uh, when I zoom out, I can't help but be convinced by the, the uh, one side just keeps winning the bet over and over. It's like, the, you ever seen those, the IPCC, uh, uh, like uh, gas price, you can remember, I think it, those are carbon projections where it's like the, the actual curve looks like this and their projection always looks like it flatlining at the current year for like 12 years in a row. And at some point, the 12th time you make that prediction, you should really, really, I don't care what your model says, like look at the last projections and like what happened every time. And like, really this time it's not different. <laughs> And like, uh, there's like an intellectual honesty there for me. The, yeah. the, where it doesn't matter if my detail upfront model predict what it predicts, because it, it's clearly not, you know, the zooming out one level, it's clearly not true. Yeah, there's this, I think, uh, what's his name? The CEO of Intel, uh, Andy Grove in, in high output management. He, he was arguing in like the seventies or something, maybe even sixties, he's saying he, 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 he Draw out like a forecasting stagger chart where you know you you forecast what whatever whatever it is you want to forecast for the next six months and then you update your forecast the next month with the new numbers and then you update your forecast and then just do that every month and then so you have the stagger chart where you can see how your forecast was off and he was like you know why don't we just all do this like why don't all economists and journalists and everyone just do stagger and forecast charts and then we can just see for ourselves whose forecasts are correct and whose are wrong and it's like yeah obviously but it hasn't caught on yet which is a strange. Uh, Dalton, you have thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Um, to keep it short, I think I'll, I'll, I'll touch two things. Um, trying to steel man the opposing view with the idea that I think um, we're missing a large percentage of the possible views here. Um, one reminds me of a quote that I'll butcher, and it's something like, we are paleolithic species with in pre-industrial age institutions, but with the technological progress of something approaching gods. Um, and we, we lack the wisdom um, or we haven't advanced enough biologically and institutionally to handle um, some of that technological progress that we've reached. Uh, and there is a thought experiment about this. I don't remember if it's Kurzweil or someone in that corner of the memeplex about drawing um, balls out of an urn and growth of knowledge is, is white balls and society is getting better and better all of the time because we're learning more and we're progressing. But hidden in this that we can't see is potentially catastrophically existential knowledge, something that could go horribly wrong. Consider maybe engineered pandemics or some super weapon, it could be AI, some people say. Um, I'm, I'm not certain that I fully buy that view, um, but it's the best place that I can start to like problematize, uh, I think of, of what we're currently talking about. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll quiet up with that, thank you. Yeah, I think my, my one-liner thing about that is like, yeah, we're really lucky that the pandemic wasn't much worse. Like the disease mm -hmm. is not, you know, like everyone's get for like turns out it's kind of like pneumonia, right? But like if it were two or three times worse, like we would see a very different considering we're so much more connected, right? Just a thought. I mean, imagine imagine if it had a longer incubation period where you were infected and it was more lethal, both of which are utterly possible. Yeah. yeah. Or if it was like, like the Spanish flu, right? If it attacked children or polio. Right. Like imagine yeah. the same pandemic uh, where children are like, I mean, I think this is a probably society would have fallen apart uh, multiple times. Yeah, so we don't know if, you know, if the thing were actually worse, would our, you know, so the gradient of how bad it is, would the gradient of our response have 
shifted accordingly. Like I, I, I don't know. And I almost don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something. There is something in our. At least I'm a millennial, and 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 I think for for our generation, there is something that feels almost sacrilegious about this kind of thinking. That oh, it could be worse. Uh, and I don't know if it's because our parenting involved this heavily. I think we were all raised you know, in a uh, kind of in the 80s, 90s. You know, it, it was very typical being told by your grandparents or something that oh, you hit your knee, but it could be much worse. And maybe we just don't like that. But for right. me, the whole pandemic experience. I mean, and this is why it's important to kind of look at your own life from a kind of historical perspective as well. Like I had just left London when the pandemic hit. And so for me, even in the darkest moments of the pandemic, when it was winter and or when I had COVID when I was home, you know, it was kind of the externally imposed depression and loss of agency on the world. I always thought like, oh my God, but at least it didn't catch me in London. Like I knew what those five variables would have been different. Um, and I was like, all right, but this time I'm out. And, and, and that there's enormous power in that, right? I don't know, of course I don't have the, uh, there's no control group here, but um, you know, I think it's al always important to know that you know there are dodge bullets in our lives, and we we like to forget about them. It you you it could be so much. If you don't think it could be so much worse, you lack imagination. Yes, because I can just think of so many ways so fast where like we we got actually quite lucky and we're far from the the bottom. I. I don't know what a golden age really means. I mean, it's one of those terms that like you can kind of define for yourself what you want it to mean. But I know that like, take like environmental damage, like uh, global warming turns out to be ha ha to happen at the volume at which we release carbon dioxide on a scale of time where we still actually have, assuming geoengineering, time to react. It, that's like lucky. Yeah. Like if the if the factor if the if the heat factor of releasing CO two into the atmosphere like was higher like if, if you know just the, the the physics of it were slightly different such that CO two was more like methane we'd be screwed like and and that that's just kind of, and maybe maybe we would have noticed sooner but like yeah, yeah. The, but actually to notice global warming really you want the space industry and there's a big gap between when we start burning fossil fuels and when we gain the ability to introspect and find out what we're doing to the planet's temperature. And if if it had turned out to be like just more impactful by the time we got, before we got to the space thing, like you could just get be totally screwed by that. So like yeah. we've gotten quite lucky actually, repeatedly. I, I think, think that's the that's probably my, my the thing that where I am most pessimistic or most fearful is what happens, the not global warming, but the next unanticipated side effect we're not aware of. And what if we don't, like global warming was like a, like a four out of 20 in terms of badness compared to where it could be. Right. You know, the, the COVID maybe, was like a three out of 20. Maybe a, maybe, maybe a golden age is, is when you're not in a non-golden age. Maybe that's, <laughs> kind of, that's what, that's what we, we can hope for. But I, I, I love thinking about this stuff. Like what if the enigma hadn't been broken or you know, the guy doesn't call the, close the tap in Chernobyl. Like it could have been so much worse, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. Just my, yeah, yeah. When, when I was like seven or eight, I was reading about World War II in Singapore and how that caused hyperinflation and everything. So it, it drove me nuts as a child. So I, I might be a bit traumatized still from that. But like, yeah, so I, I did become- maybe these are sitting in Singapore reading about hyperinflation. Like what else like, are you doing? <laughs> I, I went to school. I'm like, guys, money isn't real. And my friends are like, what the fuck's wrong with this kid? <laughs> you were the original but, crypto dude, you and Neil Stevens. Like. I know. And it, my thing is that, you know, even crypto is not enough. Like the only thing that you can really count on are other people. But anyway, um, yeah, so like the thing that could happen in a pandemic that didn't happen is actual collapse of societal trust in in like authority altogether, which is like, uh, you know, if you've played zombie games like The Last of Us, they explore that. Like what happens when the people, not just like the, you know, kind of anti-vaxxers and the, and the sort of extreme, I mean, I don't want to call them extreme, but like the people who are doubt, doubters, they're like, you know, 5%, 10% of the population, maybe 20%. But when you get to like, maybe like most people don't trust that the authorities can handle what's going on and they kind of like violently see, like basically collapse into anarchy. It's a thing that can happen. You know, historically it has happened in certain places before and there's no reason why it can't happen again if there is a sufficiently bad crunch, but we managed to stay that off, stay that off and so... <laughs> yeah uh ricardo your thoughts 
Yeah, uh, this is very thought provoking. It's very interesting. I think my main thought is like, um, so for me, different ages have very different consequences depending on the subsequent time period. Like a certain age can have a very positive consequences up, a certain, up until a certain time and then switching to negative. In the same way, the, net, the negative feedback that Emmett described that sort of like slows down rate of innovation might actually be positive at the upper meta level of things remaining stable and not you know, going completely into, uh, into entropy. So I guess the question is like, if an age has different consequences depending on sort of the order of consequences, the order of the nth order, like how do we even go about picking what, what order of consequences make an age golden? Thoughts? I think my, my so yeah, I guess each, so each person kind of gets to, it. so it's kind of a, the cop-out answer is that everyone gets to interpret themselves, like what they want to make of it. I think, I think the, so when you examine historical scenes, um, usually I, I would say my personal uh, definition of something that counts as a golden age is when, it's kind of meta, it's like when there is some consensus that the things that happened during that time like the con like so while it happened during that time the contributions of that time kind of echo throughout history beyond that right so like if you invent zero and then your society collapses after that like inventing zero is something that everyone else can can enjoy for the rest of time and like same for you know signing the magna carta or you know declaration of independence like there are certain innovations certain there are cultural innovations as well right it's the suff suffragette movements and stuff like that um, that's, that's how I choose to think about it. So it's very much, uh, okay, we have this shot at making some kind of peak mo moment, but can we, you know, as we build our library of Alexandria, which is Wikipedia and YouTube and, and Twitter and everything, right? Like everyone's coming together. There's a ton of information being assembled, but like, can we kind of project it into the future? Which is, it's, which is interesting because it then implies that a golden age really is not just the moment, but it is the contribution to all of time. And that can be influenced by, you know, so future historians can really legitimately retroact retroactively declare some period a golden age, during which nobody at that time, except for like 12 friends maybe, right, who were working on something, uh, would have agreed that it was a golden age. But then you look back and you're like, oh, those contributions were uh, super valuable. Does that make sense? Yeah, E.A. Fisher, you want to you wanna share your thoughts? Isn't information a necessary? Yeah, I, I, true. <laughs> what do you think? No, no, yeah. The, the thing that I wanted to tell, uh, talk about is that perhaps we, when Dalton talked about the the threats that we can have, uh, trying to steal man the argument that we're not in a golden age is because we are like trying to mitigate like all the possibilities that we're opening for progress. Like we can actually understand them to be there's like a dark side to them. Um, but one way that we can actually argue that perhaps we're not living in a golden age is not talking about those issues around like a horizontal line, but in terms of like, um, like that we're not seeing the distributional consequences of the, our progress. That, that is one of the things that we could, um, that we could talk about. And, if, and again, like there is like even like the, like there is like a billion people like around the world that are not, have, that do not have access, sufficient access to food, like medicine and all that. Um, and there's a beautiful story about like Margaret and Atwood about like this, this place called Amulaz that is like very nice, very cute. And the thing is that it all depends on the suffering of one child that is sitting in a palace, right? So basically what's like the dystopia there is that you actually have this perfect world, but the things that you, the, the perfect world depends on the suffering of, of, of someone that you really don't see. That like you could argue that nowadays you could, that Twitter and like all the, all the, well, social media has made transparent the costs of progress around the world. Um, but the fact that it's a transparent, is it, does it mean that it, does it mean that it's also that we're doing something actively to do it? Because for instance, like we, we know about the, 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 the urgency of climate change, right? And the things that many countries around the world are trying to just, uh, um, just backpedaling, you know? you're, just, you're just like trying to buy some time. And the thing is that transparency is not equal like effectiveness. So perhaps that's a, that's another point to still man the opposing argument. 
the billion people who are still in you know, dire poverty around the world is probably the single worst argument against the golden age you can make because it was 4 billion. Like the, the triumph of the late 20th century and early 21st century is the lifting of billions of people out of subsistence level you know, poverty. Like if we have one like true golden era, like accomplishment from the past 30 years, it's like the median person in China or India is just so much better off or Africa for that matter. Like there's this incredible thing of Africa where you should show 50 years ago and today literacy rates or pick whatever metric you want to do. And it's the, the children in Africa today versus the children 50 years ago, it's night and day, completely different world. And that's incredible. Like, I think there's, there's, there are other things that make me more worried, but like, for me, that's like this, the, that success story is so beautiful. And like, we're, we're about, we're, we're almost done. There's only a billion left. Like, what are we going to do? What are people going to do when, when there aren't billions of people in dire poverty who don't have enough to eat and clean water? Like there's all these charities that are going to have, I don't know what their mission is going to be anymore. Probably mental health, I think. That's yeah, no, no, I, I mean, actually, I can think of lots of things to go do, but like, it is, yeah, the, the water education. line moves up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do they have education? How do they have uh, access to good food, not just food? How do, you know, there, there's actually tons of stuff to do still. We're nowhere near, but like, but we're, we're almost, we're actually almost done in a historical way, solving this, like, this problem that has plagued humanity literally since humanity has existed, where most people live in dire poverty most of the time, all the time, and are in danger of starvation. That's like norm. That's the normal thing since as long as we have records. There is no period of, and we're maybe within our lifetimes could see the end of that at any real scale. That is insane. Like that's like this, this incredible achievement, far more impressive to me than like the moon landing. So I don't know. I, I'm, the hope that it won't fall yeah. back, right? I think a lot of people are worried about the great filter or the other another you know wave of dark 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 ages of whatever form. Um, totally. And I think maybe maybe we could like you know become or go go at it from a very Freudian perspective as well, or 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 something similar, and 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 ask are people who are speaking out so strongly against progress really worried about raising their own hopes in some ways uh, because you know it implies that there might be more to lose um, and there is something about the idea that you know if we make the world incredibly pleasant for everybody um, the loss thereof will be incredibly unpleasant for much more people. where are we going to get the great artists from if we don't have enough childhood suffering I know. Like some somebody I just, has I, been starving. Our, 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 childhood, our, yeah. our great art pipeline is going to get stalled out. Uh, with that, so, I don't know. The problem is, I don't. I just don't think that we're anywhere. We're just joking, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we're just so far away from that, actually, that I don't think that we're any, in any trouble of running out of great art because it's the removing suffering from the world is. You know, we're still we're still pretty far. Um, the climate change thing. I just wanted to uh, make a recommendation for a book. Uh, the most impactful book on climate change I read recently is actually Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson. Here's a new sci-fi novel he's written that I can only describe as a global warming thriller. And uh, uh, Termination Shock is, uh, I think it is the most realistic depiction of what, what may actually happen that I've read yet. Um, can and, you give uh, us a little bit of a spoiler? Like just like a little uh, bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, close your ears if you don't want to have any spoilers, but uh, the, uh, uh, basically, uh, global warming is real. It's like sea levels are going up. Venice and the Netherlands and Houston and Miami are all like, oh no, we're all going under, like we're all wealthy and powerful and yet our cities are, and countries are about to disappear under the waves. This is not good. Uh, and this guy in Texas decides, you know what, screw it. Uh, uh, I'm gonna fix it. Uh, it's not that hard to throw sulfur in the atmosphere. We don't have to wait for a volcano to do it. I can make this happen. And just, you know, starts, starts throwing up sulfur in the atmosphere. And we actually don't find out what happens later. Uh, but uh, uh, I wonder if the sequel will cover that. But, uh, but that kind of, I don't know if it'll be, you know, someone shooting rockets of sulfur in the atmosphere or something else. We know that somebody but, will survive because there will be a sequel, so. 
it's right. Well, no, but I, I guess like, uh, it's funny, uh, of all of our problems, I'm far more afraid of COVID too, the more dangerous bio, uh, you know, like like disease sequel than I am of global warming. Well, global warming is, is like clearly gonna be very damaging and kind of a catastrophe on the global scale. Uh, it just seems like, like the math on it is just like, well, if we're just willing to like actually make some hard choices, we can, you know, one country could fix it by like launching a big solar shade. Like it doesn't actually take, it's you, getting the carbon out of the atmosphere is hard, but like tuning the temperature of the planet is actually well within our reach engineering wise. And therefore, you know, ultimately I believe it will be taken care of by someone at some point. It needs the equivalent of like wartime mobilization, which we've seen happen in our history. And like, we know it's, it's just that yeah. the coordination, and it's like everyone's like, I can't go first. I have like my local yeah, yeah. to worry about. So there's like this, this dance. And, and so that, that does suggest that, you know, I really like when I was about 20, I read this book by Thor Norrit-Randers, who's this Dutch physicist who wrote about everything. It's an interesting guy. But anyway, uh, he, he, he argued very compellingly, and this became like a formative thing for me. He argued that, you know, there was a time where people were legitimately afraid of impending nuclear disaster, like just like the US and the Soviets are going to blow each other up. And people were actually act, like day to day, they were afraid of it. It was like mentioned in like casually in TV and, and radio and the children were doing duck and cover at schools and people were legitimately afraid. And then over time, people just got less and less afraid. And like, like the, the nooks are still there, you know, it's just that. But what, what, so, so like what happened, the, the argument is that basically consensus and, and global understanding shifted. So it's like, it's like a pref preference cascade, right? Everyone knows that everyone else is worried about it. And because everyone knows everyone else is worried about it, you're no longer worried about it. It's like Sting wrote, wrote a song that's like, you know, I bet, you know, my hope is that the Russians love their children too. And they're all these global peace activists and all these everything. And, and that just kind of adds up to, okay, if everyone's human and everyone's like, let's not blow everyone up, then okay, we don't need to worry so much. And it feels like there's got like, we managed to do that with old media technology, right? With TV and, and magazines. And now we have TikTok and Twitter. And it's like, we, it's, yeah, we spent a lot of time just kind of making noise and, and yelling at each other. But like, it is, it is. If we needed an emergency broadcast system, we've never had a better one ever in terms of like the global brain. And so, yeah. It's really interesting. I mean, I can totally imagine a situation like, you know, the, uh, the nuclear standoff of the Cold War where people like during a pandemic felt or, or facing, uh, you know, often facing climate change, you know, you feel that your personal level of agency is completely limited, right? And, and you know, this might make somebody feel depressed or it might turn them into pessimists. Uh, for optimism, you tend to either need a great belief in something and that some, something will take care of you or that you have agency and, and the space within which to, um, to act. And then the only thing that remains is talking about it. I think this is why people, People who are pessimistic about politics are pessimistic about social media because social media is a, is the place where, you know, agency is exchanged into the coins of chit chat. Um, and I, you know, going back to millennial pessimism, it would be an interesting thing to uh, to ask if uh, if uh, part of why the mood is so bad in in my generation is because we kind of grew up or grew into um, this almost you know, directionless chit chat instead of taking civic action or, or something more substantial. It's puzzling to me that people think that like politics, it's hard to have agency in politics or hard to have agency in global warming or whatever, because I, uh, I look at politics, there's this woman, Sonia, who, who decided that housing in San Francisco was bad and just kind of showed up and started pushing. And I don't know. Yeah, I met her at Tyler Cowen's conference. An, an yeah. expert in it, or had any real, you know, I think she's she's fairly talented, but I don't think she had it. She did anything that was beyond most people's ability to go do per se. Except she showed up and kept doing it and kept doing it, and then when it didn't work, she kept doing it. And like something like five, ten years later, there's like real stuffs happening, and it. She's had a really clear impact. Where that you know, like, it's, and it, uh, the people who say the problems, you know, you can't impact that problem. Like, well, have you tried showing up for like five or 10 years in a row? Because if, I, I, if you if you try that, I bet, 
I bet you'll have an impact. I will like, I'll post a bond that if you show up uh, for, you know, 10 years on a problem and you don't have any impact on the progress, I will like donate some money to a charity or something like I guarantee, but no one will take it. It's funny that the people don't do that in general. Like it's hard to stay focused and to show up and to keep showing up over time on something. But like uh, the reason she had an impact, I think, is because for the first few years, everyone wasn't sure if she was serious. But by year five, uh, you started to see things crystallize around her because everyone knew that she was serious and that it was worth investing in. Uh, because if you gave her resources, there would be someone still building on that five years later. And like, I think people underestimate the, yeah, it's really, really hard to have an impact on something in an agency over that problem in the like, you know, in a three month window. Good luck. Okay. The under, yeah, the under, being, under, being underestimated as the shore upper generally. I mean, obviously you and I talked about this uh, with regard to Interns Act, right? Like, yeah. people are like, so many people wanted to do businesses around hosting salons. Well, just go and do a thousand salons. Like, just just go and, and, and show up and do it. Yeah, I've, I've also noticed this in like uh, my local politics and news kind mm -hmm. of social activism scene. Like uh, people start, you know, everyone wants to start a magazine, everyone wants to start an organization, start something, and it, they always have a grand launch, very excited, everyone shows up, and then it's like, it lasts about a year, and then they, they run out of money, run out of resources, somebody, you know, quits, some internal conflict, blah, blah, blah. But the interesting, the real interesting thing, if you ask me, the people who are really holding the whole thing together are the people who've been quietly, kind of persistently blogging for like 10, 20 years, and they really get to see, you know, you get to see... You even get to outmaneuver the media. You get to outmaneuver the government. You get to outmaneuver because every such institution, nobody gives a shit that much. Everyone, you know, they get promoted. They change departments. Like, like I've I've found that um, I've been called an activist locally sometimes just for remembering the news because the news does not remember the news because the reporter gets promoted. Someone changes. Like they just don't keep records very closely. So like a person who keeps records of things for ten years is like instantly, uh, you know, you start out like some weird nerd in the corner, but like 10 years in, you're like a valuable piece of history. Like you're a literal, literal historian that really literally contributes to the world. And you can do this with anything, right? Any, anybody who blogs for 10 years becomes a valuable member of society. I really believe that. When you, having a longer time horizon is this like incredible hack for outmaneuvering literally everyone else. Like if, yeah. if you're thinking on a 25 year time horizon and they're thinking on anything significantly shorter than that, it's, uh you the, it's the it's like a it's like a superpower um, yeah the problem is you don't get to change it all the time you don't get to update you have to like and the, what's really hard about that the reason why, the reason why this doesn't happen more often is to to do this you have to know yourself to know what you care about and what you're what you what not what sounds like a nice idea for you to like you know that you sounds like a laudable thing for you to work on for 25 years what you actually care about and actually want and will still want to work on five years from now 25 is going to be a long time. Let's say even five. That's like longer than most people stick with most things. And so uh, uh, knowing what it is that, that you, you, you actually care about. Uh, um, I mean, the, sorry, uh, I see like the, the learn fast, fail fast thing uh, is a really big difference between uh, iterating on the actual stuff you're doing and iterating on your goals. Like iterating on the goals is dangerous because if you switch goals too much, you never make any real progress. But iterating on what you're doing is a great idea. Like, of course you should like do stuff and then some of it will work as of it won't, so you should do more stuff and not, don't do the stuff that didn't work and do more of the stuff that did. But like, that's very, very different from, from changing what it is that you are, what it is you care about, I think. I think, I think of it as like domain commitment. So like for me, my, my actual domain commitment is like writing. I just love words and I know that I'm going to mm -hmm. obsess with words until I die. Like I can, you can lock me up in a library and I'll be happy, you know? And like, so that, you know, that allows me, and for some people, they are dom I know I've, so I used to kind of like music. I still love music. I expect to play music for the rest of my life, but I met a couple of people who, for whom, music is to them what words are for me. Like, you know, like they wake up in the morning and they want to play the piano or the guitar. And I'm like, I, I like music, not that much though. So I know that they are going to be doing that for 80 years every day. I will like return to it every now and then. And it's like my, my you know, like a friend, but for them, it's like, like they're married to it sort of. And so, yeah, it's, I think if you know what your domain is, like then you mm -hmm. can kind of 
stay there. And you can ex- there's always infinite complexity to explore in a domain, right? So if you're into music, you can like take a decade long detour into jazz and another decade long detour into like you know metal. And then like a decade later, like you're synthesizing both of those things. And it's, you're still in music. You never left music, but like you're you're learning from all these areas. But like if you're like if you switch from music to I don't know architecture, it's possible. Like I, I, I don't. I, it's difficult to talk about. But like when you have continuity or you have multiple threads that you can tie together, like it's a it's a thing that can be done. It's not that you shouldn't, you shouldn't switch domains or whatever. Although I, but I, but rather that like if you're always, if you're always switching thing, if you're if you're right, if you launching the the thing that you're going to move, move the needle on something that you care about, and then give if you in a year you'll have made no progress. Right. This is what it's what startups, the thing that kills startups over and over again is people expect to be successful in a year. And like you should expect to be successful in seven to ten years. I know very, very few people who kept trying at the same problem in startups for seven to ten years and didn't have some level of success. It's almost no one actually manages to keep trying and doesn't eventually come up with something. Uh, uh, Lu- sorry. Lucia has a hand up. Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, I will go to Luciana in a moment. Just want to add something to uh, to this, if that's okay. Um, because I, I really, I, I love Michael Nielsen's idea that um, I think he was the person who tweeted um, that everybody just has one idea all their lives. Like we have one idea, and then we keep like something bugs you since you were young, and and uh, so that has been bugging you, and you kind of explore that in in every area of your life through projects, through relationships, through you know, travel, whatever um, um, you're doing. And so I do think that, you know, really changing goals is more of a crystallization in, in a human life. Um, but I do like, you know, I'm 38 and, 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 and I often think whether, you know, just in the progressive, optimistic, po- pessimistic uh, dichotomies as well, like what if that changes? Like what if you are supposed to be, you know, becoming, more, I don't know, um, nostalgic or reserved or, um, I don't know, um, just a difference. Um, what if that changes with age? How, how should that, is that okay? Or should we strive to stay what we are forever? To me, that, that seems to kind of negate the idea of, of progress in itself. So there are, some, there are some paradoxes here. Maybe I should just like drop it into the room and, and, and we can come back to it um, after Lucia um, uh, asks her question. Uh, or if anybody wants to go now, uh, you can drop in. Um, can I actually, thanks Anna, and so great to meet you too, Visa and Emmett. Um, and just everyone is ever, these salons are, pff, mind blow um thank you for being here actually lucia has a big big salon series coming up starting in january with interintellect uh on the future and and progress more of the future because surprise i love talking about it um i think this is um i will i will actually like to start by answering my view on your question Anna. and i think it should be entirely allowed for this to evolve in our position on that to evolve with age because the whole point of it is that there are others coming refreshing that kind of pipeline I really believe that um, I'll retire I early think... I promise I'm not <laughs> no yeah um I think my my uh, kind of comment slash thought on this commitment as a superpower uh and inspired by something I've seen today on Twitter uh so this guy came out today to say that if COVID happened pre-internet everyone would be vaccinated and it it triggered a ton of tweets from people like us, like a lot of us would have tweeted the same. Well, actually, no, the science and technology of it says that if COVID happened pre-internet, you wouldn't have been able to do the uh, kind of like the genetic, like the sequencing and all of that, which was perceived so uh, rapidly in 2020. And that led to the speed the, the speed of releasing the vaccine or other people saying, no, actually misinformation is in minority of the kind of getting people to huddle around the benefits of this. But again, it's people we choose to see either the opposing view and have the impression that's taking over or sit in a bubble that we kind of belong to and just think, oh, isn't the world, isn't the whole world like us? So I wonder what is, 
and I wonder, and I also have thoughts, but I would definitely like to get others to, to mention as well, on commitment being a superpower and us feeling like we're carving a path because we need to talk about the future. We need to pave the kind of optimistic look towards how are we preventing things like this happening again. What role do we have in bringing others on board versus isolating or alienating them um, how do we step out of that or do we even have a role like are we just better or are we supposed to be showing others how to think um, how does that work what do you guys think I just think of the vaccine thing yeah it's crazy and uh <laughs> I wonder if you went back historically how long it would actually, the role it would have actually taken. Because if you look at most penetration rates over time, the rate at which we expect things to go from zero to everyone in a society does it is now like, oh yeah, like, you know, smartphones, like what, 18 months from, from no one has them to literally every human being owns one, maybe 24 months, something like that. Uh, whereas it used to be like, like it took, the, you know, inventions like the refrigerator or whatever, take, took multiple decades to achieve saturation. And I, I just wonder truly if you went back and looked at the full rate of, you know, vaccine gets invented, full penetration of society. I wonder if it actually is slower. You, you, you're leaving aside the whole invention of the vaccine thing and the distribution mechanisms, like how long is it, did it used to take versus today? I don't know, it's really, I would be curious to see one of those charts that shows the, you know, the line, bunch of lines of penetration rates over time. Um, that was, I, I, sorry, I, I got stuck thinking about that after you said it. And I, I, <laughs> no, I, it I, is I, why that. <laughs> your question was, what responsibility do we have? Is it to... And if we have any, yeah, because we are committed. I do think that those who are, who see this age as the golden age, I, I also consider myself to be that. And I absolutely have my days where I'm like, oh my God, this is the end of the world. I have COVID, I can't go home. The world's going to this. Uh, and I also think that's totally allowed, but I am committed deep down from where I was as a child to where I am today and further on to the idea that this is the best age to live in and we would have had it so much more difficult in the past obviously without realizing because if you're in the past you're just in the past um but like what because we are so committed to this and we are getting together and having these conversations i i personally feel i have some responsibility and maybe through the line of my work as well because i work in tech policy and this whole educating and informing and getting people to talk about what is good so I, I have I, I feel an inherent responsibility to bring people along the journey, but actually those people might be like, leave me be, I'm happy with my opinion and I don't need to become, does everyone in the world need to become an optimist um, in order for things to change for the better or oh, actually? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm very excited to answer this question because I'm, I'm obsessed with this. This is really, this is like my, my call, my commitment in life. If you see, I have this Domino's <laughs> meme, if you've seen it. And the idea there so, is that, so there's a quote No, because from, I've never seen that meme before. We can, we can, we can, we can, we can, I don't know what you're yeah. talking about. Sorry, so, there's a quote from Margaret Mead that says, uh, never underestimate that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because indeed it's the only thing that ever has. And then you take that quote and you look at every single great scene from, and like frivolously, right, from, from reggae to jazz to the homebrew <laughs> computing club to everything. It's always a very, very small group of people with very, very high commitment and very, very high uh, alignment and intensity. And so the thing I would say, I'm, I'm now very, I, like a year ago, I wasn't so sure, but after doing all the reading, after reading, after scene, after scene, I'm like super convinced now. You should never try to persuade people who are on the fence, right? You should never try to sell to people who don't really want to buy. Rather, you should find other people who are excited and have, com have conversations with them that are public facing. So like the amazing thing about a scene is like, a dozen people who are obsessed and then but the work they produce is facing each other it's like i'm writing for you you're writing for me but anyone can read it and the cool thing is because the vast majority of people don't really have strong feelings one way or another so like if you try to sell them they're like why are you selling me shit but like if you and your friend are having a great time people are like why are these people having such a great time let's go and let's go and investigate what's going on and there's even this adorable video of um like somebody trying to get a child to to play some reading game like read the words or something and so these two ladies 
they they play with each other and the child that was playing with the toys turns around to see that like they are like clapping like so what happens is a lady says a word and then the other lady like claps her hand and like they have high five then they keep doing it and they're having such a good time that the child wants to participate and then participates and then it's like now they're all playing together and i think it's that i think like our task is really not to and yeah i think with a lot of progress type things there's a lot of like kind of scoldy, preachy energy. Like, you should be, you should care more about the future. It's like, ah, really? Must, must we be scolds? Like, we should instead find people who are excited and then, like, you know, make YouTube videos together, make TikToks, whatever, just have a lot of fun challenging and, and supporting each other. And then it's like, when the when a, a dozen more people show up, you kind of involve them. And a dozen more people show up, then you involve them. Then you have, like, a more and more bustling scene. And then from there, I think we can. And we don't really need everybody. Like, we never, ever needed everybody. We just need... I, I always say it's like we have like 0.01% and we need to get to like, eh, if we can get to 3%, that would be like the greatest golden age in human history ever. Like if 3% of people are optimistic and committed and, and you know, pushing things forward. And that's great. Like people don't need to, you know, it's like a, another frame I do use for this is like, so I, I like the idea of shamans, like people who, you know, in a, in a village or whatever, they are kind of helping people with storytelling and meaning and everything and it doesn't make sense to have an entire village of shaman like what's what y'all like who's gonna make the bread who's gonna make the who's gonna be the blacksmith like you need everybody to do yeah what they're good at but um yeah if you have like a handful of really good shaman they benefit the whole community really really well so it's like trying to find the like, find, find the people who are already attuned to this work and to this this sort of stuff so i'm very passionate i went on, I went on like a full thing but that's yeah that's my position yeah i love I'm the idea of, of of the of role modeling right like that's what we are talking about we're we're role modeling i, I it, it's interesting that you know we're the three of us um you know are leading this salon but i don't think we are fully in agreement like i, I personally don't think that this is a golden age yet i think it's uh in, in the future <laughs> i think we're still we're still just like laying down the foundations and um in many ways but i know that for 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 instance this company so internet like this movement organization you know what we try to do is is role modeling right uh to say that you know if we want to have a better public arena, um, the way to do that is not to um, try to, you know, go and change politics aggressively. Um, it's more showing the kid how to play the game with the, the words and the and the clapping. Um, do something that's better, um, and hope that more and more people will notice it and either copy it or participate or just get that little kick of optimism that it's it's possible. Vivek? Uh, Vivek has, his, has had his hand up for some time. Vivek, you got some thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, thanks Visa and thanks uh, Emmett and uh, Anna. Uh, I had um, a few thoughts. One was, um, well, you know, proposing this idea that like maybe, uh, well, first let me, so there was some discussion earlier about, you know, um, social progress and economic progress and you know one of the best arguments for uh for for greater for for why we're in a golden age is that we've lifted a billion people out of poverty right uh in the in the last uh, decade or so uh in in india and china and I, I just wanted to point out that you know also there was a discussion about where else would you have wanted to live you know in in the in, in back in time nobody wants to go back in time uh but i, I think i think I, I just wanted to propose a couple of um clarifying points there where you know yes that's true but hidden in that could there's a lot of social trends that are masked like for example class mobility in the US economic mobility is worse today than it was in the 80s in the 90s and you know it's it's progressively getting worse economic inequality has gotten worse uh, you know uh, you know the cost of housing the cost of college education the cost of um, health care you know people you know the, Ha, they've all gotten worse and so my uh, so so I'm you know we, while things are happening in the developing world uh, the the idea that technological progress or even like interconnectedness automatically engenders a better world with less suffering 
is, you know, it, we need more to back that up. I don't think that is automatically true. You know, we, it, it, you know, we would need to exam in some cases that is true. And in some cases it is, it is not, it is not an objective truth that on all measures were better, uh, for ex in the U.S., for example, uh, than than we were before, there are some measures where we're worse, and you can see that reflected in people not willing to have, you know, the fertility rates. Like people are, it, it's 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 expensive to have families, and people are really struggling uh, to do that. Where you know you could support a family on a single income, maybe in the fifties, sixties, even seventies and eighties, and it's become it's gotten, you know, harder and harder uh, to do that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to propose that and see what people thought of that because I, I think that that side of the argument should be represented fairly. So, um, yeah. So like the, the housing is a great example of this because I, I, I agree with what you were saying at, like, at a very high level, which is things are not better across every metric. I, the point thing I would point out, actually, you didn't mention that I think is the, one of the most important ones, which is that social atomization has gotten vastly worse. And that's a big problem. And that, it, that actually is definably worse now than it was in the 50s. But... Take the housing thing, actually, it's really subtle when you look at these things, right? Take the housing thing, which I happen to spend a lot of time thinking about and know some of the stats offhand on. Median house square foot per person today versus the 70s. Where, 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 who do you think has more housing per, per, per person now or the 70s? United States. Yeah, but, but it's like 70% more square feet per person. So maybe housing is more expensive. That's actually just because people don't want to put up with living and housing that they would have been normal in the 70s the density of people per per square foot that would have been totally normal you, you know you'd have your two people in a one bedroom with their young child that's okay that's just how it is uh now we're like oh that's way too small i want more i need more space than that and the suburbs the rise of the suburbs and it means people can't have more space which is wonderful i'm really pro people getting what they want but then we say oh well housing is so much more expensive well no our our standards have gone up we've actually delivered way more and and the price, you know, the amount of money spent on housing has gone up. Don't get me wrong. I'm really into the idea that like we like, should build more housing and make it cheaper. But if you zoom way out at some level, a hundred percent of the money has to get spent on something. And so if food and iPhones and everything else gets cheaper, something else has to get more expensive. Whatever, wherever the bottleneck is, that thing will get more expensive because people will have leftover money to spend on that, to consume that instead. And so it's almost inevitable that the supply constrained things, education, housing, medicine, will become more expensive. In fact, directly proportionally to how much everything else gets cheaper. Uh, so I, mean, I, I don't disagree. I don't wanna be Pollyanna. I don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying at all, that like things are not better across every metric. But clearly not. Um, but, uh, uh, I think that it's important to recognize the subtleties of changing. We Our expectations shift, the goalposts move over time. Things that we regard as like truly out of bounds today would have just been normal 50 years ago. And it's, it, that, but it's so invisible. We don't even, we don't even think about it. Um, so anyways, that's the, kind of to go back to the expectation management. You know, the, uh, sorry, Dalton, I was, what I, the metrics I'm talking about are median numbers, not average. Median is up 70%. That is wild. That is so much more housing consumption than what happened 50 years ago. We consume vastly more housing. All the houses that have been, think about it, like we build houses, they last a long time. We keep building more houses every year. How are we running out of houses? Well, because we consume more and more house, um, which is great. I mean, very pro, I'm in favor of it. I'd like to kind of combine Vivek, Amas, and, and Lucia, your points, and, and, and tie it back to Visa's original tweet about the noise and how we don't actually have a clear perception of, of what, what we're living in, um, and the responsibility of clarifying that. So if we assume that it's beneficial for, um, uh, for the world and for us participating in a positive way um, um, in creating the future, then we need to have both realistic expectations and a clear understanding of how the world looks today, beyond moods, beyond trends, beyond you know, one piece of news infecting the 24 hour news cycle and ruining everybody's you know uh, general outlook on life 
Um, what can we do? Like, do you, first of all, those in the room, my co-hosts and, and, and guests, do you have a personal practice, whether that's meditation or journaling or a trusted group of friends that you, with whom you, are, you talk through the day's events? Um, what do you do when you try to take a step back? I, I remember when, when uh, the Capitol riots happened last January, nearly a year ago, um, we had multiple interns like songs that night. And the hosts obviously came to me and we had a kind of, you know, emergency powwow together, uh, what to do if, you know, things escalate during your salon and, and you find yourself like Walter Cronkite kind of having to live <laughs> lead uh, mankind through, uh, through um, uh, the events of the world. And it was really, you know, it, it, was, it, it was really interesting because what we were talking about is how to give people a breather and how to contextualize things, which is what internet tech hosts do. Um, but I'm wondering what that looked like, what it looks like in, in your, your lives and, and what can we teach to kind of go back to Lucia's mission? How can, how can we teach the world that? Um, I, I, and if you agree with me that that could be actually a good thing to do. So my super quick kind of personal solution for myself that I sort of share with my friends around me by just being a nerd is that I've, again, like, so when I was a kid, I was reading about World War II and Japanese hyperinflation. And it's just that, yeah, it's just really always having a long view of history. Like, you know, just, just, just look up interesting things throughout. And it's, it's not like, it's not a very instrumental approach. It's like, it's literally I, what I always invite people to do for fun, like really for fun, like when you're bored. Like go on Wikipedia and just look up old stuff of whatever it is that is interesting to you. Like, uh, you know, so I'm always curious about people, public intellectuals from the past. You know, how did Dante go through his life? How did Goethe go through his life? How did Montaigne? I'm just curious about that. And then you just see around the details and be like, oh, Montaigne died of, like, he was wealthy, but he died of like a, like a throat infection, which like, he was the wealthy as hell, but without, a throat infection killed him that today you go to the doctor, you're, you're better the next day. And then you're like, okay, what, what changed? Antibiotics, oh, Fleming. And then you just start, just follow your curiosities and you start to develop this, this tapestry of, of historical understanding. And it really just contextualizes whatever it is that you're going through day to day. I think for me, it just kind of gives me a sense of uh, peace. <laughs> you know, just this, this big, long, you know, nation states are like temporary blips in, in human history. And it's like, I think that there's a bit of anxiety at first when you're like, holy shit, everything's in play. But then after a while, you're like, eh, when you hear some news, you're like, okay, cool. That's, that's my approach. I love I, I that. Know. Maybe there should be like a meme sequence for people lifting people's moods, like just like weird things people used to die in. Like the Turkana boy died of an infected tooth. Bah! I did like short sightedness, you know, and not even driving a car, right? Um, sorry, just a kind of dark, dark humor uh, 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 parenthesis. I'm not yeah, <laughs> Um, I don't know about Bach I, death or I guess I, <laughs> I wish you so I think about this these, these big goal things recently I was just writing something for myself I write these blog posts to myself that I don't that I don't publish because uh, uh, I don't know why I don't publish them it's a good thing to talk about at some point but uh, the people visualize this big future and they tend to try to work backwards from the goal and visualizing the big future is very powerful and important because you have to you don't know where which direction you're going in right I need to go east by southeast. But on a practical level, what you do on a given day is actually pick your way forward across the landscape and cross the ford the river and actually go north because there's a mountain in your way. And you need to go around the mountain and get to the mountain pass. And then you go south. And if you were to look at your path on any given moment, you might actually even be heading east. You have that in bearing in mind. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to go there. But you spend most of your time asking what's next. I was just talking with uh, a friend about scaling his business. And he was like, we have this internal debate. We're really getting into this big argument. Like, should we be trying to hire this many people over five years to get to this or this many people over this many years to get to that? And I was like, I don't know. Like, what are you doing? Like, I, I align with your goal in general. Like, that, you know, that's a reasonable place to try to get to. But like, what about just like, what's, what about next year? Right? Like, what, and, and can you focus, what, what's the focus on that? And I think that I feel the same way about, it's like, if I had to say there's an area that I care about personally in terms of my big goal, it's like community bringing people together, connecting them. Like Twitch has been a really great opportunity to do a lot of that. Um, it's one of the things I like best about 
running through it, which is why I'm still there, is I get to do a lot of community building. But when I think about what to do next, I think about like, what's the, what, I have a vision of this world that we, I could get to, but I have, but I spend most of my time thinking about what's the next most, what's the next incremental thing to go do. Um, and I think that that's usually the more, how that do I build the lungs? Yeah, exactly. Rather than, rather than, I don't try, I, I don't try to solve the, right. There's an old bumper sticker that, that I, I only came to understand as an adult, think globally, act locally. And that's, I really come to appreciate why, what's important about that. Like, yes, think about world peace, but then you tend, you tend your community because actually there's nothing else you can do. Working on the global problem is impossible. The best you can do is to work on the thing that is local for you. Yeah, that, that, what I was just gonna say before you went there was really like my approach while I have the Domino's meme or whatever, like the thing is really, first of all, you take care of yourself and you take care of your friends around you and you try to find good people and you associate with them. And once in a while when something horrible happens in the news on the other side of the planet that you can't do about and you feel strong emotions, like you then, you know, kind of redirect that energy, that anger, frustration, grief, and like commit to watering the plants, you know, like whatever the plants are for you around you, like just encourage good people doing good work. And that's like the, that's the resistance right, against the thing. Uh, Natalia, you have thoughts? I do. Uh, first of all, plus one on looking at history. I actually have an example here. So this is Ooh. a night. So this is an um, 1894 uh, encyclopedia of eight volumes that I got uh, this year, Great Men and Famous Women. So let me start with just saying that uh, the representation of men to women in this 1894 encyclopedia is better than for Forbes 30 under 30 or whatever, like, like the list. So, and then that's back to your point. When we talk about the past and like the dark ages and the dark past, we often operate on the assumption that past was bad. Uh, but I do agree with Visa that actually like reading things about the past, whether it's understanding how did people think about the golden age and at that point of time, whatever that point of time is, did they perceive that they were living in the golden age? Did they perceive that the golden age is just around the corner or did they, you know, have nostalgia about golden age of the past towards themselves? I think it's very interesting. And it's not sometimes what you think it is because yes, sometimes you find those ironic moments of, how did people die? And it was ridiculous. Or sometimes you find, on the other hand, that actually how people spoke about their their era or you know each other, it's actually way better than we think it is. So read the sources, uh, I think is one of the things that we all, all, all got to do if we're trying to understand the future. Looking into the past to understand the future is something that I think as humans, we sometimes don't do enough. Um, uh it's a little bit like going back and, and do like a cognitive time travel or point of view time travel no uh like i love bill bryson books for for this reason because he kind of like puts you back into the mindset of how in shakespeare's times all the old people who were 30 right but already dying thought that these young people who were 15 are so lazy they are going everywhere on carts the young people no longer walk Right, uh, or during the pandemic, I reread um, the name of the rose, and I completely forgot about this part. How, you know, in in the you know mid plague, medieval times, people really did think that it was like nothing was left. Right, this is with the big core um, uh, conflict in the name of the rose that William of Baskerville believes in the future and thinks that we should invent things, and everybody else is like, well you know, the antiquity was great. Now it's a decline and let's just like prepare for death. Um, is this, uh, is this uh, something that you would find um, helpful, Natalia, as well? Do you like go, go, go even uh, deeper into the past? Uh, for educational purposes. I, yeah, I think, well, I think just, just reading like and, and figuring out as close to the sources it is, what was it like? Because I do believe that we have a lot of assumptions. Uh, and uh, when you study prior art, you usually go backwards in time and you study kind of the most recent prior art that is based on you know the other prior art also the best people just read sapiens which is essentially a reader's digest of you know a few books that that he read and you know and they make their opinions of the past based on that which is also cool right but but you have to realize that this is just a reader's digest for your own good um but this, yeah, this this book, uh, yeah, this encyclopedia, first of all, I love encyclopedias, but the interesting thing is that even the language, and this is uh, Zenobia 
the Queen of Palmyra, and this volume is about workmen and heroes. So you wouldn't expect a lot of women in there, but there's actually a lot. Um, I think that it really, yeah, I think it really makes me more optimistic about the future because the past wasn't that bad. Like the language that people used uh, writing in the 19th century, uh, this is the original original edition, is actually makes me believe that there's something good about humans. The other thing, uh, so that's back to Visa's point about the sources and just reading about the past examples of people, because I, I think that to really understand the struggle and how to deal with struggle, optimism, pessimism, personally, I think that that historical account is, is a very good way. The second thing that I was trying to do was a chart with all this. <laughs> um, and the chart was basically the question that that was on my mind as, as you all were speaking was, is it possible to be personally pessimistic, but optimistic society wise? And then I was like, okay, so what, why don't I try to make a two by two <laughs> with um, personally pessimistic, society pessimistic, personally pessimistic, society optimistic, and then try to figure out other even people like that. And what is the what are the factors that make us optimistic or pessimistic about ourselves versus the society? What's the overlap? Because I think that's to Lucia's point about how do we even impact the society's optimism, pessimism about it? Um, so I think that, um, by the way, I, I really like Emmett's Emmett's dad's 10 to 15 year project uh, framework. I love it. I think I have a similar way of thinking about things. So um, I, I wrote it down uh, and because it's just crystal clear. Um, but I think on the personal level, uh, what a lot of us covered here is sometimes it's just chemistry. Like it's as, as dumb as, you know, being in good physical health, being in good mental health, which is then, you know, partially matter of heritage because if you get just naturally good balance of serotonin against whatever then then you're naturally optimistic uh it's it's a lot of self-work it's a lot of um uh, balance of struggle versus non-struggle right like I, I, I'm, it's very rational of me to say but you do need some struggle in your life to be happy and i think a few of you are called out on that um but um uh, as we think about society or group optimism um one of the one of the books I think that are very optimistic is uh, Jim Crance's Failure is Not an Option. And when he talks about optimism and how he retained optimism, one thing that he mentions a few times, I don't, I don't, I'm going to butcher the quote as well, but, but he talks about that when he and the other leader uh, worked on things, they were both very optimistic. And what that translated into was their unconditional support for the teams. Right. And so like, if you know the story, and you probably do, <laughs> uh, they needed optimism. And, but I think there's something about that unconditional support to ourselves and to others um, in order to drive the optimism forward that is, is practical, but also needed. Um, and as we think about that connectedness between society, societal optimism and, and our own thing, I think providing more situations for agency or more chances for people to act and change something and achieve something is one of the ways, but then the other one is related to beliefs. And I think that beliefs and, and that unconditional support um, overlap a lot. Um, uh, I agree that it's hard to act globally, so we have to start with the groups, but a agency and beliefs are two things that I feel like a lot of people called out on in the chat or um, in, 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 in answers. So. Lucius, to your, to your point, I think those two things, agency, like how do we give more people more chances and how do we support people better are the ways to stay optimistic. And the last question that I will leave you with that's on my mind, does it even matter whether the next age is the golden age? It doesn't matter. Like, why do we even care whether it's golden age or not? How is this relevant? What, like, what, what's what's why? And I don't know if we should spend time answering because it's a little bit of a kind of downward spiral, but that's what I was thinking about. I mean, yeah, my, my, my approach to that is just sort of, if we can have, I mean, I, I always, you know, I, like, I think of the, of the children, you know, the kid, like just if, if there is a spirit of, of excitement in the air, I think that is just fun to have. But if we don't have it, that's, that's not going to deter me from doing what I love, you know, like if, if everyone around me is like, no, Visa, there's no golden age, fuck you. I'm like, okay, then, you know, I'm just still going to do what I want. Uh, but anyway, I really like your point about agency. And, and uh, I, what that made me think of was how all of my friends that I have spoken to 
everybody who's ever broken a personal record in fitness related things so whether it's squatting more weight than you've ever squatted before or like running a mile faster than you've ever run before like they describe of completing a, a half marathon or something they describe it as like a and it's my experience as well it's like the day i squatted more than my body weight it's like something shifted in my being it's not just an intellectual thing it's like just you feel it in your bones that i can do more i, I just did something today that i couldn't do yesterday so what will i be able to do tomorrow Right, it's just that feeling of I can grow, I can do more. It's like growth mindset, but like in in your in an emotional sense. And like, yeah, I think that's one of the. If you can spread that from person to person, and it kind of catches on, like I think that is a tremendous thing we can do for people. Any thoughts? I uh, I really like the statement about the you know, who, at some level, who cares for in a golden age? Because I, I, yeah. that actually reflects, I think, probably where I am more than anything else. Because for me, it's not about that, right? Like, I'm going to do the same thing regardless. I don't, like, what, what for me is the, the, the underlying question behind that that I think is, that I actually care about is, like, uh, is it worth doing things or is everything just sort of, like, broken? And to me, the answer to that is obviously it's worth doing things. Doing things is great. It's super fun. And it seems like it helps people and like is good for the world. So like, I'm not worried about that. And like, uh, to what degree uh, uh, should I expect that if I make an investment today in something that pays off later, that, that's, that, that I'm not going to be around later to like be able to reap the rewards of that. And so far, the answer seems to be like, yeah, it's pretty likely. Like long-term investments seem to pay off, not a problem. And so, and I don't really just believe that either. And so given both those things, I'm like, cool. Like I, I, I get to do, I get to focus on things I'm gonna focus on. And so, yeah, I really think that's, a, that's exactly the, uh, I only get to live this, these years. I don't get to choose which era I live in anyway. Like this theoretical question of like, whether would you like to live in a different era? Like, no, no, I get the years I got, I, got, I get born in 1983 no matter what I do. That's just, that's how it works. That's the, <laughs> I didn't choose that one. And so at some level, it's not a relevant variable. Um, and it, it's interesting to think about the same way that like, I like reading Harry Turtledove's fiction on like, what if uh, lizard aliens invaded during the second world war? Like, which is a pretty cool piece of science fiction, but like not necessarily like relevant for making decisions. Yeah, I think the other thing I would like to circle back to is that, so the other thing about optimism and, and wanting to do things versus not doing things. Uh, I remember in one of my, I think when I was about 25, I was in the depths of a, a depressive episode. And the thing that kind of pulled me out of it sort of was like, like when I was trying to figure out like, is there any point to doing anything? Everything's bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And the thing that I kind of uh, returned to was, you know, like the books of my youth that I enjoyed and the music and the things that I thought were beautiful and, and great. And I, I came around to, you know, the scene on the Titanic in the movie, the Titanic, where it's literally sinking and the musicians are like, they've played their final thing and then they're going to head off. And then one guy just starts playing by himself and then the others come back to play with, I'm like, oh, you know, like all I want on, if like we are all on the Titanic, right? we're all going to die no matter what. But like, all I want is like other musicians to play music with while we go down with the ship, right? And yeah, so that, that kind of pulled me out of it and being like, even, even if everything we do doesn't, um, it just gets a bit intense, but like, even if everything we do doesn't amount to anything, I want to be around the people who are trying as opposed to the people who are screaming and you know, like, like if, if, it makes no, if it makes no difference, and I do believe it makes a difference, but if it made no difference, I want to be with the people who are trying. And like that, that simplifies everything for me so much. Like it's just, who do you want to spend your, your precious life with, right? And what are they doing? And like, they are trying to help other people. They're trying to, you know, make music or make art or make science or make tech. And yeah, that is a very elegant, um, simplifying thing, I find. Titanic Engine Room was filmed. Oh, that's so cool. Oh man, if, if I had known that, I would have gone. I, I visited SF two years ago, but I did not know that. Uh, I'm adding that to my SF notes for when I next go to SF, when that's possible. Anna, do you have thoughts? I, uh, yeah, I sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when I, when I have a down moment uh, at work, I kind of have the, 
die trying uh, uh, line playing in my head. But for me, it's not get rich. I don't really care about getting rich. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, with, you know, the advent of, of um, humanity's life without life after death in which we live, you know, when suddenly science fiction and planning for the future um, has become important uh, on a deeper spiritual level uh, for all of us, um, you know, um, we, for, we, we tend to forget about the fact that even for us, even if you really max out on this life, you live until 120 and you do all the things you wanted to do, right? Even then, some of the things that you will begin in this life will be completed by others after you. Unless we really solve death for your generation, which is probably not. Like there, there may be people being born now who will not die as soon as, as normal humans do. Um, but we will pro we probably will uh, pro at an approximately normal time. Um, and, but we don't really like thinking about that. Um, but for me, you know, I, I kind of, I want to have the benefit of the doubt that even if I don't end up finishing something in this life, um, if I put enough levers in place that um, that knowledge will be available and easy to understand, and I will have maybe people who will make sure that it, you know, stays on online or I don't know. Um, to me, that there is private comfort in that, um, and. I recently uh, found out um, that one of the great um, inspirations behind this company, uh, which I always thought happened uh, decades ago, never actually happened. So I had a, a misunderstanding logged as a memory that always gave me self-confidence that, oh, I can do this because this was already tried and, and done. And then I found out a couple of months ago that no, it was it was a plan that never got realized. Actually, the first realization of that plan is interintellect. Um, and so I really deeply believe in this. You never know where your idea will end up. You know, maybe you give an interview, you mention it to a friend in a call, you just like blurp it out on the internet, on your Twitter, you know, half asleep, and, and then you just leave and forget about it. But somebody has has seen that, you know, and you, you don't know what it will beget. In, in another person's mind. And, and I think in that sense, you know, I'm a, I think I'm a short-term pessimist, probably long-term optimist. I think that it's much easier to beget positive things than negative. Actually, people need an onslaught of repeated, consistent negative to, to really, not, you can get scared easily, but like to really ruin your mood, uh, more substantial things have to happen, but positive, you know, it's like the Bruce Springsteen thing, just a spark. Um, and to me, that's beautiful. And if you kind of like trace back your own life, how many amazing things you've done because you heard something, you misunderstood something, you know? I think there are, I'm sure there are at least, you know, I don't know, at least 20% of startups probably exist because an investor and advisor misunderstood what they were being pitched and repeated it back. Mm -hmm. And the founders were like, no, but that's better. <laughs> do that um so you never know i just like never shut up guys you know always share your thoughts because even if you can't do it you can't complete it um maybe you will have your best idea of five minutes before you die and you will like we spread to the nurse <laughs> and the nurse will become a billionaire you never know or solve the remaining one billion people in global hunger um do you, did you guys have experiences like this in your life that i don't know a, a teacher's half words to you and then you end up and you take that story and you know like how um famous novelists talk about you know they ask i don't know game of thrones like how did that wonderful character and like there was that waiter and then i combined him with my dad's gardener's daughter's bicycle you never know this is how we, we synthesize um i see so many people nodding so please jump in with, with any stories you may have about this <laughs> We definitely raised money from our first investor because he misunderstood what we were doing. <laughs> I was sure. I was. This is yeah. so. Uh, this is kind of one of the origin stories. What was the misunderstanding? We thought we were building like television, like 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 it was going to be a television competitor. We'd go get like TV shows, and we were doing user generated content. We weren't going to get any TV shows. It wasn't like that. Wasn't the idea at all. Um, but uh, 
uh, but it worked out really well for him. So, you know, just goes to show. Uh, I, I definitely he still don't doesn't know. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He, he, he told us about a year later. Like, oh, I misunderstood what you this was, but it, it's okay. You guys seem smart. It's fine. I'm still excited about it. Um, I think the, uh, uh, the main thing is that there is something rather than nothing. That there is good in the world, not bad in the world, right? Like you, 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 you look back at the full sweep of, of time and history, and things seem to be levering up into more, like you know, uh, civilization exists. I guess some people think that's a mistake, and we should all go back, but I don't. Um, and uh, and uh, at some level, it is like proof of uh human goodness because if it wasn't for the fact that in general people are on the balance trustworthy and good and want to do right in the world and want to help each other we wouldn't have the thing to lose in the first place like if you think that oh no we're on the verge of this disaster and collapse and everything's going away fundamentally you have to also believe that like that humans are good because the only way we got here is cooperating with each other and like, obviously we have both natures. Uh, humans are both cooperators and betrayers in the prisoner's dilemma in a very complex interlayered way. But uh, uh, of course we must be, we must in the end of the day be good. Uh, we, must, we must at the end of the day be trustworthy and, and cooperative because otherwise, how, do, how is it that we have something rather than, rather than you know, the war of all against all forever? And like you just do, you just look out in the world. We don't have the war of all against all. I walk down the street and like people don't steal my stuff most of the time. Um, even things they could steal, that wouldn't be that hard. People mostly are trustworthy. Not that everyone is all the time. That things, no bad things don't happen. But on the balance, people are pretty good. Yeah, I've always felt that you know. So there's this great quote by this Iranian author. Um, I, can't remember her, I always forget her name, said Marjorie Satrapi. I think she's the author of Persepolis, if you know. And she has a quote. Marjan Satrapi. Marjan Satrapi. And she has this quote, she's like, I mean, they, they, well, it's a meme where they put the text over her smoking a cigarette. It looks super cool. But she says something like, uh, I, the difference between me and, my, and you is very small. We both want, you know, good life. We both want to raise our kids, be happy, have fun, have nice coffee. You know, just we want the same things. But and the difference between me and my government versus the difference between you and your government is is bigger than the difference between me and you. And our governments are very much the same. Like this is this idea of of you know like just the nature of power and the nature of of centralization and representatives and intermediaries and so on. And it's just you know like. And I contrast this with, I use this in a thread where I'm just posting TikToks from all over the world. There's like this Russian guy who's a farmer and he's, he's like, he's in, in the cold winter and he's like checking in on his cats and he's, it's just so full of life and love. And there's just, there's, there's like billions of these scenes all over the world, right? Just people living their lives and kind of have a good time. And it's that the, you know, it's just how much of what we think is good or evil. It's like really just a, a kind of, matter of the these this centralization power dynamics you know what i mean it's like uh yeah and i i'm optimistic that while we seem to be having some growing pains and like teething issues where you know we're so we're still learning how to use social media the way like we were once learning how to use telephones and whatnot and like so yeah there's like outrage stuff quote quote tweeting bad shit for your friends i think it should be a social fall par and we haven't reached there yet like, you know, imagine like your friends having dinner and you come along and you bring something and you're like, hey, I found this disgusting stuff in the, in the drain. Here, take a look at this. And then you dump it on the dining table. They'd be like, what the fuck? Just, I'm having dinner, dude. What the fuck? But like on social media, it's like, yeah, I just saw this horrible thing. Now you all have to see it too. Quote tweet. Like, you know, we haven't yet <laughs> adopted to, that's, that's not ideal for like our respective mental health and whatnot. You know, it's just, but we're still figuring that out. But I think once we figure that out, which is like, a, which is going to be like a decade long negotiation, like overall, more regular people everywhere is a good thing because there's le things get less and less kind of like swayed by the ideologues and the people with very strong kind of, yeah, that's just my, my, my perspective.
and I'm kind of naive that way, but like I, I, I'm committed to this <laughs> all the way to the end of the line. It, I, it kind of takes me back to the question of uh, people wanting bigger and bigger houses. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm kind of on the fence here, right? Because you could argue that um, that the internet is making us, especially social media, is making us far more narcissistic, uh, wanting much more. Um, you're constantly aware of what other people have, and they are no longer superstars that you would be reading about in, in magazines, but normal people like you, right? Um, and everybody showcases what they have, so you kind of fill in the gaps. On the other hand, I felt during the pandemic, uh, to go back to also Lucia's uh, thought experiment, um, how pandemic would have the pandemic would have played out off, um, offline, I felt it was a great equalizer. I found secret pleasure in watching like MSNBC analysts in their sweats with their kids running around in the background in the nappies and having the same exact problem as everybody else. Um, and, and I think that it was good for the mental well-being of humanity to see that, you know, we're kind of all in it. Um, and to me, there's nothing to um illustrate more the idea that we're all in it than the internet and the pandemic like these are the only two things that we all constantly have other than you know atmospheric characteristics of the planet earth um so you know when i when, when i assume a golden age looming on the horizon um i i'm thinking about what the deep realization of this uh, will lead to in how people think about themselves, how people think about their local communities, how people think about um, the environment, what it means to, you know, maybe to actually go back to that bygone 1990s globalist ideal um, that we seem to have forgotten where we are all in it um, and what, what that means and how do we deal with the people who don't want to be in it Right. I mean, this is the whole, you know, I think half of the uh, online debates are around what to do with the people who don't want to participate in uh, the shared responsibility. Um, what, are they more optimistic? Are they more pessimistic? I don't know. <laughs> so what do you think? Is who more optimistic again? <laughs> the people who are like, no, the pandemic doesn't exist. <laughs> is oh, that... <laughs> pandemic is fake. Um, uh, I think that, so I've always been the conspiracy theorists are uh, too optimistic <laughs> kind of mindset. Where yeah. they, they want to believe that there is a certain order in the world that I almost wish it were possible. I wish people were that competent and kind of, you know, able to, but like, yeah, you know, there's, there's, I went on like a spy craft um, binge once, like just reading about spies, like because there was this new story where like a Singaporean guy was selling American state secrets to China, and the way he did it was so pathetic. It was he literally went on a, like a forum and he made friends with like an American soldier, and he basically begged him, saying, "I'm so pathetic, my life is so sad. I need to do this research paper. Can you share some state secrets with me? I won't tell anyone. I'll just you know, it's just for my paper." And the guy was like, "Are you sure, bro?" <laughs> and then he, that's how he did. It. And like, and then I went to look up more stuff, and there was like this French agency that was like kind of trying to follow up with this some like a uh, potential rogue state actor for like a year and they bungled it when they when the guy following the spy who's trying to follow up this guy accidentally emailed the guy himself like he personally emailed the guy that he's trying to like a report of the guy to the guy and i'm like that's 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 like the cutting edge espionage that the world had like um yeah, I don't know if these people are capable of, you know, pandemics. You know, it's like they it's just it's kind of, uh, I, I wish I wish we had that level of of uh project management skills and and follow up, <laughs> follow through. Like that would be a, I would like to live in that world, but like uh, it, sadly yeah. it does not seem although you know some somebody always points like one of my friends always points out that uh the Manhattan project was an example of a legitimately successful like like yes. 100,000 people were involved and they managed to shut their mouths about it. But I think that's when, you know, you really have like national security at stake and you have like, you know, that they, kind of... They also, they, they all moved them into a desert. 
like yeah, they think they, they physically and it, it's possible people knew something was going on they didn't know what but it was very obvious that they'd moved like you know a bunch of people into a desert and then like shut off lines of communication like you can conspiracy real conspiracies happen all the time yeah they're absolutely successful conspiracies the question is like to what degree what's the level of power of those conspiracies and the level of power of those conspiracies is an order of magnitude probably the biggest most successful ones are things like develop an atomic weapon yeah but like manage world global geopolitics like that's well beyond the reach of any conspiracy ever no one's anywhere near that good sorry people are just not that smart and capable and yeah i agree it's it's a fundamentally overly overly optimistic it's the same, the same thing with the the if you the people who think COVID doesn't exist and it's all this conspiracy it's just not it, we're just not they're not that good at faking data like it's i'm sorry it's just it, they're just not it's we're not you are and i think it's it it ties into this optimism this other form of optimism that there's a there's two different types of optimism and i don't quite know how to put but like there's this kind that i think is quite dangerous which i think it was just world optimism the belief that the world is fair that things make sense and that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people and if something bad happened to a good person it's because someone malicious did it yeah or if someone undeservedly gets good things despite not deserving them it's because they must have done some crime as opposed to the reality which is mostly random and chaos and just stuff happens and it has no real reason behind it at all and it's deeply overly optimistic at some level to believe there is order in the universe yeah and that like kind that. of order which just doesn't really exist my mom believes in a just world. It's, it's sometimes like I see her, like her, her WhatsApp messages and stuff, and I'm like, oh shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's strange. But yeah, it's like there a slightly was, religious background. There, were, there was I, a. Uh, sorry? There's this wonderful song I've been listening to recently. Um, it costs that much. Um, it costs that much as a song about uh, being paid what, you're, what you deserve for the, the art you make. Um, and it's great. I love it. And I, I, it's a sentiment that I've, I've heard from people who work in art a lot. And it's just one of those delightful things that uh, uh, I just said it's, it's fun to sing along to. But as I listened to it, I realized it really bothered me because the song's theme was it cost that much because I it took me years to master this skill and because I work really hard on it. And actually, no, it cost that much because that's what people are willing to pay for it because there's only a certain supply of it and the supply and demand curves cross at that point. And if more people start doing it, the price will go down. And if fewer people do it, the price will go up. And like, it has nothing to do with how hard it was for you to learn. And it is deeply an illusion that, that somehow, the, I mean, it is related because that, unless you're much worse than average, other people will also take them that long to learn. And therefore it's a rare skill because of that kind of in this indirect way, but it is not, that's this just world theory that somehow, because it was hard and much of work for me, you should have to pay me an amount of money that's sustainable for me to do this because it takes me lots of hours. It's like, no, no, no one, that's not how it works. That's not what generates people giving you money. That's deeply mistaken. Uh, but I think it's a very common mindset. Um, to the point there's a whole song about it. <laughs> we will listen to it. That's, that's wonderful. There's an interesting question in the chat. What percentage of people in a society should be optimistic for society to advance? Uh, vastly different takes on it. Um, and I would love to hear what you guys think about it. And Emmett also, I mean, I think you're here, the person leading the biggest organization. What would be the organizational equivalent of that? Is there an, is there an optimal balance of um, optimists versus pessimists in a team? Um, are there different, you know, um, areas of, of work in a big company where you want to optimize for optimists versus um, pessimists that would be an interesting uh, thing to uh, seem to seem to mostly self-sort uh, I think in general we always are operating at a deficit of number of people who uh, are optimistic in the way that energizes them to try to do big things uh, and uh, uh, like, like what I think is sort of truly optimistic, non, not like where, where they, 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 they are optimistic about that, that they, what they can do, they, they can do something important and that it's worth doing it. And that like, they, and we're always operating a deficit and maybe in theory, there'd be too many people out there all trying to do stuff at the same time. And it would become, you'd need to like tone it down. But like, we've, I, 
We're so, we just, that never actually happens. You never, you never are oversupplied. It's like worrying, it's like worrying that you, you, maybe there's some future where like, uh, we've, everyone just has such a good upbringing that like, and everything, and everything is so good that we're, we miss some important part of our society where you need more suffering. Like, oh, sure. I guess in theory that could be possible, but we're just so far away from it. You don't need to worry about that. It's cool. We're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accidentally overshoot. I promise. It's fine. Yeah, I think one of the funny things I've encountered is that there's a whole suite of, of good seeming things that people claim to uh, care about or, or believe in that when you investigate a little bit, they don't really. And optimism is one of them. Curiosity is another. I think people, if you ask them, they feel like a, a lot of people, like middle class, upper middle class, it just, it just seems like you should claim to be for optimism and for curiosity because it just seems like the socially appropriate, nice pleasant thing to do right like um but like what what is optimism really right and if, if you ask me and I, I i like to investigate my words very deeply i feel that optimism is really it's it's not just a, a posture but it's a way of being like you def, you determine your optimism by the actions that you take and and so it has to be you genuinely believe that things can get better and so if you do genuinely believe that things can get better in the abstract you would be making bets small bets you know talking to people in a certain way conducting yourself in a certain way uh, just planning your life in a certain way, right? Like one thing you believe growth is possible, so you should be growing in some or trying to grow in some way, right? Like this, and a lot of people are just like, I'm optimistic, and then you're like, oh, about what? What you're working on? And they're like, eh, <laughs> you know. And I, I don't mean to to make those people feel bad. Like, uh, you know, I think it's nice that they care about being nice, right? But it's almost funny that when we are insufficiently specific about what exactly we mean then there's this like blurry social you know polite fiction i guess where everyone just says nice things and then goes on everything continues as per normal but uh i think it does an injustice to people who are ambitious it does an injustice to people who are trying to wait well but what are we really trying to do here though what are we trying to advance what are we trying to figure out what do we want to know like just asking questions and and, and so on and so, uh, yeah, I'm always, so like somewhere in the chat, there was like, uh, what percentage of people should be optimistic? Like if you ask me what, what, percentage, what percentage of people are truly optimistic, I think it's less than 1%. I think it's less than 1%, like one in a hundred people are really, they wake up in the morning and say, oh shit, there's so much to do with it. Like, I, I'm excited. Like, you know, it's like, most people are like, eh, things will probably get better. I'm optimistic that, you know, there's going to be a good movie coming out next year. Like, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's just outlook, right? But I'm talking about, your you right like what are you doing what are you how are you kind of steering your your sales to take advantage of of things and that i think is one percent oh yeah performative pessimism that oh yeah no people but most people have just not thought about it that deeply is a good for any given topic <laughs> is a good assumption 80 percent, 85 percent most of like one of my one of my big surprises, I have like a wide set of topics. I like really just like I like like thinking about things. And one of the big surprises as an adult was finding out to what degree, with a couple of weeks of thinking about something, I am now in the top, you know, two percent of people who have thought about this. Like actually, if I spent actually two weeks really thinking about the problem and really wrestling with it and reading and really trying. And it's funny because when I was growing up, when I was like thirteen, I would read new newspaper op-eds on things. And I thought I was learning and trying and really grappling with the problem. It felt like it, it felt like I was, but I wasn't actually gaining any expertise at all. And I think that I, it, it's, there's this incredible illusion that your mind builds for you that you know more than you do about a topic until you try to go teach it to someone else or build something using it. And then suddenly you realize, oh wait, I don't really actually know anything about this at all. And, uh, or I know very, very little. Uh, and so, yeah, my, my, my new default assumption has, has become just most people just don't haven't, their opinion is not, is neither true nor false. It's not that they they don't, they don't have a considered opinion. They just haven't, they don't have a coherent, if you push them on it, and this is true for me for a bunch of topics that I haven't thought deeply on. If you really push me on it, and this is true for almost everybody, like, there isn't anything there. There's no, there's no, uh, coherent position that, represents any particular point in the space, actually. Um, it's a bit like a secondary layer opinion. I remember when I, I had a birthday a couple of years ago when I kind of like made this pledge to myself that I will, wherever linguistically and scientifically I can 
um, access a text, I should read the first source, not what somebody else wrote about it. I know this goes contrary to everything that's happening in the blogosphere and on Substack today, uh, where you know the shortest, um, the biggest shortcut uh, towards um, a successful blogging career today is just like read books and summarize them into really good blog posts because people love reading secondary sources. But if you actually let go of that um, and decide to go to the first sources, life just becomes so much more interesting. And, and yeah, I, I love this two, in two weeks going into the top 2%. Uh, you kind of notice that sometimes you go into therapy or you have like a deeper conversation with somebody and you're like, so this morning I was thinking about this and this and this. And sometimes people get really shocked that, oh, you, you, you spend the morning thinking about things like, yeah. <laughs> Like between the shower and the coffee machine uh, but i really encourage people to do that it's a lot of fun yeah there's this, great, there's this great three paragraph quote by morgan housel about his son it's so good i'm gonna read you all the whole thing right Tell now me. it takes like, Go ahead. It takes like a minute okay morgan housel my son is three he's amazing but he's three so he doesn't know very much what's amazing about a three-year-old is that they learn fast but virtually everything they know came from what they've observed and experienced firsthand He's never sat through a history lecture. He's never spent an afternoon analyzing stock charts. And he's never had a long dinner with someone from another country. So everything in his head came directly from an experience he's had. He therefore has no understanding how most things work. Imagine trying to get him to understand the nuances of NATO, impossible, or LIBOR, can't do it. Enormous, important chunks of the world do not exist in his brain. He has no concept of them. But he doesn't walk around confused all day. He understands his world perfectly. It's a world shaped by and explained with the few mental models he's picked up in his three years. Ice cream is good, blankets are warm, toys are fun, naps are not, I don't need a bath. That's his world. And everything he comes across fits into one of these simple three-year-old mental models that he's built in his head. When his parents tell him it's time to put his toys away or that he can't eat ice cream for breakfast, his frustration is caused by experiencing something that doesn't fit into his mental models. Ice cream is good. So if mom says I can't have it, that's not good. And I'm going to cry. He has no concept of a balanced diet or the consequences of a poor diet, even if we explain it to him. But in the moment, he's not looking for an explanation. He's trying to match the world he lives in to a mental model he has in his head. Even though he knows almost nothing, he doesn't realize it because he tells himself a coherent story about what's going on based on what little he does know. And we all do this regardless of age. That's Morgan's description of his son. I, was, I love it. I revisit it like every- Love Morgan night. Housel. It's so That's good. Great, great. Who is Morgan Housel? It's his great quote. He is one yeah, of he, my favorite bloggers he, as well. But I thought he came out of nowhere, but he was like, he used to blog on uh, fool.com, like for monetary stuff. He wrote like 3000 plus articles there about money. And he, he released a book, I think earlier this year or last year about the psychology of money. He's a fantastic, he's a really, really good author. At, a, lovely like, person, at, a lovely person, a lovely person. Um, my, uh, you said this about curiosity before, but, uh, I realized how rare real curiosity was, which is, I think is the flip side of this, this thing about the three-year-old son is like real curiosity is when you see one of those things, one of those conflicts, instead of it being pain, you like, wait, wait, what, what, but no, but what, what's actually going on here? And you, you get curious, like, no, but I really actually want to, I know it might be, we, we think it's this, but like, but what, no, but what, what? I really want to know what's actually going on here. And I, I, and you see that attitude so rarely where someone is engaging with material and there's answers, there's all the existing answers and there's all the things that might be true, but they really want to know, but seriously, what's really happening. I don't get it. This is confusing and I'd like to understand. And it's so, it's, it's like you're saying well, the 1% optimistic, like, truly curious is so rare and people and it's it's hard to stay curious like everyone even i think i, I think i was a fairly curious person i managed to achieve curiosity on occasion but uh like the three-year-old right i'm always most of the time i'm telling myself the story about the world in the way that makes sense and i'm papering over all the cracks and like every now and then i manage to notice there's a crack there and actually pay attention to it but it's like i, think, I don't think anyone's curious all the time i think it's a question of like can you be curious like more than one percent of the time more than two percent of the time like a, a, a thing that my wife and I talk about from time to time is that each of us, me and my wife, we both married the smartest person we know and we spend like 80% of our time not listening to them. <laughs> like whatever. Like just like my wife will say, hey, Visa, you know, that t-shirt company you're running, like that, that guy that you're working with, 
he seems sketchy. You probably shouldn't work. I'm like, ah, yeah, sure. I, I, I hear you. And then like two years later, I'm like, I, I heard you. I wasn't listening though. <laughs> like, she's like, you married me for like, and then you're like, ah, oh, listening is hard. Like really listening. But yeah, you, I heard you, you heard me. But like to really listen, you have to consider what the person said and like subject it to your, your mental models and like interrogate and consider. And that's so difficult. I think we like, again, like if you do it, 20% of the time, like that's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's really, so, so the, the crazy thing is that most people don't listen to most people most of the time. <laughs> just why? But because listening is hard. It's really, like really listening is hard. Yeah. So to kind of wrap up uh, at the end uh, here, um, I, I love the, I, I think curiosity should be the next topic we discuss in a few months. Um, to segue them together, how uh, how do you guys see curiosity relating to a golden age? Is it a prerequisite um, for more good? Um, but because when I think about a, gold, a golden age, you know, in the exploration exploitation, um, you know, framework, I think about a reward, you know, yeah. um, a shining city uh, where people are prosperous and happy and healthy, and we reap the rewards of previous curiosity. Um, yeah. On the other hand, we know that without sustained curiosity and ongoing progress, a golden age is not going to be an age, it's just going to be one fleeting moment. Uh, and I yeah. think there will be no mechanisms to sustain it. Uh, so I'm wondering what you think about that. I know I, on my own example, I know that curiosity is, is costly, right? It's, there's a reason why three-year-olds do it. It's really exhausting. Um, when I travel and I'm curious all day and I walk around San Francisco or New York or Berlin or wherever I am and just like you feel this stream of information being pumped into your head after the day I'm, I'm pretty tired and usually after traveling we go home and we need a little bit of a rest um, but I, I believe that there, there has to be a margin <laughs> kind of doable where I said okay I take away like one person energy of something else that I do that is exhausting and just like I don't know cycle it back into curiosity uh, so what do you guys think how, how could we improve on our curiosity to uh to uh, uh you know facilitate the building of a golden age yeah I think I think so when I look at my notes for past historical scenes that were flourishing like a common thing is that they were high trust environments where uh you know asking questions was tolerated. So this is very significant in like the Islamic golden age in Baghdad in the 800s, where, you know, in the house of wisdom, they would literally have like, con like, they would invite scholars from different religions and they would have like diverse discussions about virtue and so on. And this again, you see in uh, the Dutch golden age more recently, like uh, when there was like religious persecution in the rest of Europe. And basically every smart person in Europe was fleeing to, to Holland to, you know, think. Like just, to, just to be able to think you would run away to, to Holland where you know you wouldn't get persecuted for it. And except, if, yeah. except if you're Spinoza, because then you're too edgy even for them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's like um, you know, I think each individual you can you can I, I don't know if I want to talk about individual curiosity, but there is really there are really cultures of curiosity where people are allowed to, allowed and encouraged to ask questions. I think. When you encourage people to ask questions, and again, like it sounds so abstract, right? What's wrong with asking questions? But like, you know, the thing about curiosity when you ask questions is there's 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 a range of like acceptable questions, and then there's questions that go into like socially inappropriate, taboo, and like wrong, and you don't know in advance what's gonna be you know taboo and, and uncomfortable and so on, and so people subconsciously limit themselves to to some bubble of acceptable questions. And yeah, so we're definitely going to have to create. So I, I, I honestly, honestly think that II salons are great because there are questions you can ask in a salon that you can't ask on Twitter without people coming at you with pitchforks on Twitter. Whereas like on a salon, if I say something stupid, I can just see other people kind of squinting at me like, eh, are you sure? Dude, no. You know, and then we can, we can correct it as we go. So an II space is a safer space for curiosity than... I mean, so it's a different, I love Twitter as well, but on Twitter, you, you, you have to frame your questions in a way that invites solicit feedback, but you can't do certain classes of inquiry that without certain responses. That's my thinking. Emmett, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, true curiosity is very dangerous. It is. Because right? you, it leads you to places that sometimes violate ongoing taboos. And actually that happens, you'd think that wouldn't happen that often, right? Because 
there's no, the taboos are just in randomly, like don't cover that much of thought space. There's lots of things to go think about that aren't the taboos, but it turns out that the insights that most of the easy to get insights are just floating around there already. And they, if, if getting to the insight doesn't cross some taboo, some, it can't be that way in your society, uh, probably someone else already got there. It's like the, uh, no free, the, the economics, no free lunch theorem. And so it turns out when you get curious, shockingly often the thing that you are interested in leads you through some, some zone of thought space that you're not supposed to go through. And, uh, uh, and you don't know, like, you're every, you never know what's gonna happen. Yeah, how, how every, every new idea is disrespectful. Yeah. But it implicitly, yeah. it implies it's, it's, that the old idea is bad. Some of them are harmless. Every, sometimes, sometimes you get, I get curious about things and it turns out what's behind it is totally harmless. Interesting, but harmless. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, I can't say that out loud. And like, you, you never, you have no idea. It, it's where we're, and, and it's much safer and faster to just not do that. And so it's not surprising people don't do it that often. Also, you're right, it takes a ton of energy because really thinking about something like chess grandmasters burn 6,000, 7,000 calories a day thinking. Like yeah. you lose weight playing at that level. And so if you're, when you're really thinking hard about something, your brain is literally, it really does make you tired. You're consuming this vast amount of energy. And uh, you can't be curious about everything all the time. If you're curious about 1% of the things that are coming up in your life, that's a lot actually. And uh, what I think it actually, the, the, you know, the, I don't know if, it, if it's a, for a golden age, but like for intellectual progress, obviously it requires curiosity. You can't, you, all intellectual progress depends first on curiosity. Curiosity depends on like, some cross between safety and courage, right? Like you, you need courage in order to like pursue it, even though it might, it's, it might lead you to a scary or bad place, but also there's like some amount of safety in your society that like it's rational and reasonable to pursue it at all. Like sometimes courage is, courage is just foolhardiness if pursuing it leads you to really bad outcomes. Um, and so there's some combination of like making it safe, but then also having people who have the courage to go do it anyway, even though it's not, one, it's never gonna be hundred percent safe. Um, Maybe this is why small groups do it, like what Visa was talking about with regard to the scenes, right? Because then you have an energy ecosystem, right? You can have one person who's doing the hardest labor of thinking on the day and the others act as support, or that you can share tasks, you can rest together, you can create a psychological safety. You know, if you do something as a group, it feels less foolhardy. Um, okay. Maybe there's and a, a small, kind of balance uh, system to, uh, like if somebody is going into the wrong direction, the other is pulling back. By the way, guys, if you don't like to go to the gym, chat, high level chess. <laughs> you heard it. <laughs> Too lazy it for the treadmill. If, you're, if, you're, if, you want to burn, to if all you want to do is burn calories, it's fine. Uh, and actually that might work. It doesn't, you're not going to have your cardiovascular help at all. Uh, so I still recommend Not everything, okay, but, but like something. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to build on Anna's point about scenes because uh, the thing that so I, I'm like a huge again my Domino's meme thing is like I'm 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 advocating everyone to try and make micro scenes amongst their friends because like four or five people can push each other out far out of homeostasis from like what is cultural norm everywhere else which is, you know, when you have like a Lennon-McCartney relationship and like, I'm going to write a better song than you. No, I'm going to write a better song than you. And the next thing you know, you have like two guys who write so prolifically and they don't look weird because they're trying to improve on each other. So it's like, it's like that, that one-upmanship, camaraderie, brotherhood thing. Same for like um, Calvin, I can't remember, William Wordsworth and the other guy, Samuel Coleridge. Like they were like, they were basically Lennon McCartney for English poetry and whatever. And they hosted like friends over at their house and like they became freaking, you know, like poet laureate and, and they like made romanticism and like the whole scene of poetry emerged around like that rivalry. And like, you know, Max Planck and, and his wife, they would host house parties and like Einstein and friends would show up and they would play music and they just try to one up each other all the time. And then, you know, they freaking moved science forward right for all of humanity so it's really a group of like i think six to twelve people can really and it's like if you have a like a bigger group of like hundreds of people i think that's actually harder because then you have like social politics at that oh that person's so high status they have so much more twitter followers than me or whatever but like when you have like really four or five people it's like you know c.s lewis and tokyo right like hey your book sucks dude like oh i'm gonna write a better book than you fuck you and then they start doing then you get law of the rings and you get chronicles of narnia right so it's really that that direct um 
but you have to be friendly enough that you're still showing up to each other's face every day. You can't just kind of... So it's, it's that very... Uh, you know, I was reading a Masters of Doom, which was about the people who founded the um, It Realms and they made the video game Doom. And just, you know, they were at the start of all the, the first-person shooter games, right? And John Romero and John Carmack. And it's really interesting to study the, the chemistry of their relationship. Like, it's really this... this uh, uh, yin yang sort of thing like it's a creative destruction kind of conflict where if they were both had the same kind of disposition you sense that they would have just they wouldn't have made what they made it's like really they were different and there's that that willingness to be at conflict with someone but in a way that creates sparks uh pen and teller described having the same thing the wright brothers described having the same thing so i'm like ah if you're ambitious you should really find someone that you can fight well with and keep fighting with for decades and then like that would be amazing. The seniors, right? The the, the, yeah, the yeah, Brian exactly. and seniors. Um, there were. I will find. We did a salon recently on this with uh, Matt Clifford from Entrepreneur Fest and a couple of other people, and and there was this piece of research that popped up at the time that showed that actually popularity is a really really important um, element in innovation. Like somebody like Rota Feynman, like he was adorable, right? And and if, if there is a popular and the less popular person of you know. The, with equal levels of talent, the one with more friends will be uh, will be more successful. Um, and I think this is also something that's underrated, which we, we somehow separate um, our friendliness or our emotional ties from the hard professionalism of thinking, no, those two things are together. Like you're not going to have that kind of psychological safety and comfort with somebody uh, to make, you know, those, um, to take those intellectual risks uh, unless you really have trust and trust you know builds in in in, in private situations that of course doesn't mean that use your friends and <laughs> you know um, transform uh, all of your relationships into transactional but knowing that you know uh, work there there's a good chance that work-life balance is a myth and you will probably spend most of your time on earth uh with your work um, and it should be something that you really love uh, and that you deeply believe in. Um, probably it's going to be 10 to 15 year long projects um, and to surround those decades, uh, during the, those decades yourselves with um, people that you, that you love being with uh, will be the most beneficial thing you can do <laughs> for, your, uh, for your intellectual progress as well. That would probably be my, that, that would be where, for me, curiosity and a golden age as two topics merge. Um, it's, it's the same. Yeah. I have a lot to say about this as well. I think it's, so I think, I think with regards to what you're describing with work-life work balance, I think it's like the degree to which you can kind of create demarcations and stuff is a, is a function of how ambitious you are and how close to the cutting edge of something you are. Like, so if you're, you know, if you're literally in advancing physics, like as, 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 uh, Max Planck and Einstein and friends were doing, then it's like you and all of your friends, each of you are carrying pieces of the puzzle in your minds. And like, you can't really separate professional and friendship and everything. It's just, you are basically all conduits for the magic that's happening at, at that cutting edge. And like, it's your duty if you're Max Planck to call Einstein at 2 a.m. in the morning and tell him what you just learned. Like, it's not up to you. It's not up to him either. It's that. And if you don't want that, then you can live a meaningful, good life, being a good parent, a good friend, you know, nine to five, everything. But then you will be a bit further away from that really cutting edge, insane kind of thing, which is also fine. You know, I think sometimes there's conflicts between these people who are normative about this way of living versus that way of living. And I'm like, it's not necessary. You just choose just how much of a thrill-seeking, seeking insanity person are you? And then you just, not everyone needs to be jumping out of planes, you know, like those of us who want to, we should. Those of us who don't, you shouldn't. But like those of us, those of you who shouldn't, shouldn't get in the way of the people who are trying to, you know, move things forward and yeah I, I sorry really... to, to interrupt but it, it's really important to you know von Bartel says that you know in order to understand the system try to take away a part of it right and see what happens and this is how seniors work like there's a reason why you know a band a startup a good tv series actually can collapse just by yeah. the removal of one person even if they're like tw 12 people carrying the, the pieces of the puzzle, like there is some kind of like, you know, everything in life works in systems. If you have 12 people's brains, a system will be built out of those 12 people and you can't just like extract one. It's like losing a, yeah. a bodily organ. 
Yeah. And and to me, that would be a really interesting way of thinking about your scenes in your life. Yeah. Right. Like, just Im imagine, I don't know, like I lead a startup and I know that, oh my God, one person is on holiday. That's like a whole thing. Like you have to plan for it. And, you know, and suddenly you understand much more about what that person is doing than on a normal day. But that would be mm. super interesting to, to explore even like friends, families, you know, your church choir, whatever community you're in, who, who, who carries which puzzle? Because you will understand much more deeply what that community actually does. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I could talk for an hour about how like the appetite for destruction, Guns and Roses configuration, those five guys, every single one of them was critical to how magical the, it's like it's really it's really like a ballet on like a tripwire like a hundred feet in the air like it's it's amazing that they managed to pull it off for however short that magic lasted like it was it was really and that it, it's interesting how often this 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 uh, metaphor crops up the idea of like a volatile chemical ex controlled explosion like in jazz it comes up in in uh, I, I think it came up somewhere in masters of doom as well like it's just this idea of this very high out high like you know high intensity controlled explosion that lets you go very far very fast but like everyone's on the edge of chaos right and it's it's um and it's it's a dangerous life like psychologically like if you fall off like you're gonna get hurt like like you can't sugarcoat that you can't pretend that that's not the case like you want to work on these things and like you know like you your friendships may get ruined you know it's 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 it doesn't make you a bad person if when you and your friend are having an argument about something that is, you know, high stakes, that something, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just the thing I think about. I mean, Emmett, I'm sure you have more <laughs> insight. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I thought that was pretty good. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I don't know. I, 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 it was uh, one of the rare times where I'm like, no, that, that summarizes it. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly with Closing you. Closing statements. Yeah, uh, but uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot less energy to sit on the sidelines and speculate, and it's a lot more fun to go do stuff. Indeed. And make things. Amen. And to do that instead. Amen. Love it. That should be our that should be our uh, our coda for today, guys. Thank yeah. you so much for coming together again. I would love to come uh, together again, maybe in a couple of months, to talk about curiosity. So homework, everybody, think about this, write about this, uh, tweet, tag. Um, I will keep an eye on it. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. I think I ordered like five books during this conversation. <laughs> um, uh, if, if I don't see you at the um, holiday party on the 28th, um, have a lovely uh, holiday break. Uh, if I do, then uh, please bring your most ridiculous sweater. Uh, it will be very competitive. <laughs> and see you guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>